The next ring camera footage happens in broad daylight. There appears to be nothing unsettling about what's being shown here. It just looks like a male holding what appears to be a box of candy. Like one of those people that go door to door and try to sell you something to help support their cause. But what happens next will blow your mind. Here's what it looked like. I've seen many freaky ring camera footages online, but nothing beats what I'm about to tell you. If there ever was a candy man that existed in the real world, you're about to witness it. It happened about a month ago when I was home alone. The world would have never witnessed what unfolded if I hadn't installed a ring camera on my front door. It happened on a Tuesday in broad daylight. I was working from home on my laptop when I heard my doorbell ringing as a safety precaution. I always like to check the surveillance footage to see who was out front. There stood a gentleman that looked to be in his mid-twenties with a mask over his face holding what appeared to be a box of candy. At first glance he looked like one of those candy salesmen that sell chocolate. Door to door. I found this rather strange, as people who do this kind of thing were typically on the younger side, but I didn't see any harm in it. I ended up entering the foyer and opening the door, only to see the same individual I saw in the camera, except he looked more deranged. Close up, he sir, would you like to buy some chocolate? Um, how much, how much you got? You seem like you have a nice house, you must be loaded. How about you buy all my chocolate, kid? You don't just come to someone's house and request, shut up and buy my chocolate rich. Boy, how about this? Get the hell off my property and leave me alone, or I'm calling the cops. Get on the floor, you little. And that's when I got robbed. Point blank, it all went down in a split second. Several bandits ambushed and robbed my house, leaving myself and the candy seller dumbfounded. But after the local news stations got a hold of the story, it was later found out that the candy salesman was a part of the whole robbery scheme. He had been going to multiple houses around the neighborhood, posing as a candy salesman only to lure people to open their front door. A brazen robber posing to sell candy, along with three other people, are still on the loose tonight. A frightening daytime armed robbery home invasion that happened on Monday in Stockton has a lot of neighbors nervous. What appeared to be a young man selling candy in a North Stockton marauder area. Neighborhood quickly turned into a homeowner's worst nightmare. This neighbor, not the one robbed, captured video through his own ring camera about five minutes earlier of the alleged candy man. Coming to his door, he watched a live feed on his home ring camera as the phony candy seller came to his door. I've only been a massage therapist for a little while now, but I don't think I'll be able to keep doing it for much longer. I started working at full time Monday through Friday. Immediately, I was getting exposed to the full range of customers that came into the massage parlor for most clients. It's easy to just block whoever they are out of my mind and stay in the routine mindset so that I don't even remember most of the people I massaged in a day. Though every once in a while the person is worth remembering. That's one of the major perks of the job. I don't make very good money as a full-time massage therapist. But every so often I get to massage somebody who's pretty hot. I still have to keep my composure. No matter what, though, like this last Friday night, we close at 9 o'clock where I work, and at around 8.30, there weren't any clients left in the building. All of my co-workers and I were just milling about, waiting for closing time. But that's when we got the call. I was the closest to the phone, so I picked it up. We've reached the massage experts. This is Timmy. How may I assist you this evening? Hello, Timmy. I need a full one-hour session tonight. Do you think you can help me out with that? Well, unfortunately, we're due to close in about half an hour. Would you like to reschedule? No, if you can't do it tonight, I'll just find somebody else who can. Okay, why don't we squeeze you in for our last available half-hour session? No, no, you don't understand. I need an hour. I'm so worn out from working all week long. I need full body work. You won't be able to get it done in 30 minutes. 
I'm plus size, as in thick with two C's. I really didn't want to end up getting out of work at nearly 10 o'clock. But I had to be honest with myself. I had no plans for. Once I got home other than cracking open a beer and watching Netflix by myself, and that could wait. I needed a little extra money. Plus, the woman's voice was so sultry and intriguing. Not to mention I had a thing for women on the voluptuous side. I figured an hour alone with her seemed like an opportunity that I shouldn't pass up. So I stuck my neck. Out for her sure thing. Ma'am, we're here for you. Just ask for Timmy when you arrive. Thank you so much. Timmy, I have the sinking feeling in the silence after the call that I'd made some sort of mistake or that I had done something I wasn't supposed to as a professional massage therapist. I tried to ignore the feeling while I waited, watching my co-workers get ready to go home as I prepared for another client. It wasn't until about 8.50 before she finally showed up. She was not what I was expecting, despite her voice making her sound like a model. She was the farthest possible thing from it. Not only was she fat enough to eat models for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, with her ample belly fat spilling out from underneath her oversized blouse and barely fitting through the doorway into the lobby, but she was also ungodly ugly. She looked like she had been called crater face in high school, with horrendous acne scars all over her face. But the acne had never really gone away. Her morbid obesity had long since warped and stretched away any beautiful features that might have once been on her face. And now it was just a big sweaty ocean of grease. A perfect environment for all her zits boils. Blackheads, skin tags, and moles. Hey there, boys and girls. Which one of you is Timmy? Despite her mutated appearance, she knew what she was doing with her voice. Somehow, she managed to uphold a demeanor of self-confidence so unshakable that it could only be defined as one thing. Moxie, even my co-workers, struggled to maintain their professionalism, giggling and jeering loud enough for everyone to hear. But there was no running away from any of it. For me, um, I'm Timmy. Well, of course, you are the woman charged up to the counter, like a bull shaking the foundation of the building. It's sure nice to meet you. Timmy, the name's Bethany, but you can call me Big Beth. Get it, like Big Ben. But me, I only let handsome men like you call me that. You understand, you look like George Clooney. And I love George Clooney. Have a great evening. Timmy, see you Monday. I wanted to stop one of them and beg them to stay and help me get rid of this Big Beth woman. But it was too late. They clocked out and left me there with the behemoth and heat staring me down with hungry, hungry eyes. She kept leaning more and more on the counter between us, forcing me to smell her pungent body odor. I almost gagged all those long, unwashed years, all those spots she definitely couldn't reach in the shower, just oozing with a stench like a hobo cuddling a skunk. You can go into the massage room and get comfortable whenever you're ready. I gave her a few minutes head start alone in the room. While I waited, the clock hit nine and I felt myself split into two. I wanted to run away. I wanted to go home and be by myself and not deal with her, but I knew I couldn't leave her alone in the parlor, and I knew I could really use the money from the session. I just hoped that she would be as big of a tipper as she was. Everything else, when I went in to begin the massage, I was not surprised. I steeled myself and oiled up my hands, then began the massage. Her body was like a rippling sea of fat and endless skin. I struggled to find any actual muscles to work on, and all that dead weight that spilled over the edges of the massage table. It felt like I was just digging aimlessly through the folds of jello, uncovering all the crusted sweat and lint I had feared of. But that wasn't even the worst of it. Oh yeah, that's good. That's good. You really know how to use those hands, don't you? Get all the thick girls calling you daddy with skills like that. Bethany, please, you don't have to say any of that stuff. Oh, but I want to. I bet this is just how George Clooney would give a big girl like me the rubdown she needs. 
I've heard the stories of how some people try to take a massage further than it's supposed to go. But I never thought I'd be in a situation like that. I thought that was something only female massage therapists would have to worry about. But I've never seen anything like this woman. She, she asked for a lot. I didn't want to do any of it. But I felt that I had to. I needed the money and I thought it wouldn't be so bad if I just kept my eyes shut and only breathed through my mouth. Now, Timmy, my back is just fine. You're doing a great job, and I'll be sure to pay you well. It's just, I need help in other places. Would you be a good boy and help out a woman in need? Somehow, and I still don't know how. But she convinced me, maybe I'd forgotten just how disgusting she really was after having my eyes shut for so long. Or maybe I'd just gotten lost in the sweet sound of her voice. But I did everything she asked me to do. I, uh, uh, I clipped her toenails because she said she couldn't reach them, and they were starting to grow fungus. So I agreed. They needed to be cut when that was over with. She asked me to shave her legs, because she was going out Saturday night, and she didn't want to look like a bear, and I agreed that on top. Of everything else, she didn't need hairy legs, and... Of course, she asked me to take a washcloth to all the creases in her belly, which I did, just to be nice because I didn't think anyone deserved to smell the way that she did. After all that, she asked me to clean off her feet, finally after the longest and most arduous hour of my life. It was time for her to go. She got dressed with a big smile on her face and a sparkle in her eye, giving me all sorts of compliments on my work. Before she walked out, she left a huge stack of bills on the desk and kissed me on the cheek. And then she was gone out the door, and I haven't seen her since I washed my hands and rinsed out my mouth as thoroughly as I could. But no matter how hard I tried, I could still taste her before I went home for the night. I thought I'd count my hefty payment for the ordeal, but that's when I found out something that nearly killed me. Those bills, not one of them had the face of a president. Each and every single bill was the same face George Clooney. This story was inspired by a disturbing case regarding a student who had been experiencing paranormal activity at her student home. This went on for quite some time. Little did she know this would lead to something much more disturbing than what she would have ever imagined. Here's what it looked like. I was a student at the University of North Carolina. I lived at a dorm complex near my campus with several other roommates. At the time of the story, I was usually studying and working for the most part. But besides my busy lifestyle, my boyfriend and I were really into horror films. There was a lot of discussion and reviews about the hit movie series Paranormal Activity at the time, so we usually had movies like that playing whenever we hung out. What made the series so unique was that it was facile, silent, but creepy. It was similar to watching footage from a surveillance camera, wherein the characters caught evidence of paranormal activity in the house. Hence the movie's title. The poltergeist effects throughout the film were so realistic that they gave us goosebumps. Since then, all the time spent watching ghost films would turn my boyfriend into some kind of voice. Whenever he would sleep over, he would wake me up and ask me to accompany him to the kitchen or the restroom whenever he needed to drink a glass of water or answer the call of nature. In the wee hours of the morning, one day something particular was happening. At my place, I was usually organized with my stuff, so it was easy for me to indicate if something was missing or out of place upon returning home from work or school. I would always find pieces of clothes missing, like shirts and pants. Naturally, I told my boyfriend about it, and he just laughed it off, saying, Babe, you need to really stop with the paranormal activity. See, it's turning us both in a little pool. Max, I'm being dead ass. I feel like my clothes are seriously going missing. That's when Max suggested that I probably got my clothes mixed up with my other roommate's laundry when I went to confront them about it. They all denied my accusations, which unfortunately led me to develop further trust issues with them. So as the days passed, things got more incongruous. More and more clothes went missing, 
and things in my room started moving out of place. I even saw ominous handprints suddenly appearing on the mirror, like someone had just pressed their hand on it. Moments ago, I was starting to get convinced that there was truly a paranormal essence living within the household. It was odd indeed, because after watching TV at night, I would always put things back in order. So one day, while my boyfriend and I were having lunch together, he said, Hey honey, do you want to move into my place instead? You could stay there if it makes you feel better. Confused at his sudden proposal, I asked, What brought this up? Max was hesitant at first, but eventually he told me there could be something in this dorm. Matty, his eyes were restless. I couldn't pinpoint what it was. He was trying to say, so I asked him to be more vivid about it. Then he whispered, Do you remember the movie Paranormal Activity? I think it's not safe here. My boyfriend was downright terrified when I asked him if he had experienced anything out of the ordinary. He mentioned that he had heard loud thuds coming from outside the hallway. One night I tried reasoning with him, telling him that it could have been the other roommates. But he shook his head dismissively and told me another incident where he went to the kitchen by himself one night since I wouldn't get up, no matter how much he tried to wake me. Then, while pouring himself a glass of water, he felt that someone or something was glowing at him from the living room, according to him, while the kitchen... Lights were on, the living room was pitch black at the time, attempting to adjust his vision. He immediately made a run for it back to the bedroom upon noticing that someone with mucky long hair was peeking from behind the sofa. I didn't want to believe him as none of my other roommates had. Long hair, not even the females, they all had short hairstyles. So I said, hey, there's no need to be paranoid. All right, nettled by my lack of consideration. He stood up and said, are you calling me crazy? I know what I saw. Okay. Okay, okay, I believe you. Now calm down, I raised my hands in silent retreat. My boyfriend was so mad at me that he went home that night, leaving me all alone in a place he claimed had some kind of poltergeist. Yes, I was alone, as my roommates were usually out of town or headed back to their respective family's place on weekends. On that same night, I had passed out from a long day of work and studying. I remember hearing the door to my bedroom creak open. That's when I saw some kind of creepy figure with long hair glare into my bedroom with illuminated eyes. When I turned on the lamp next to my bed, the door was wide open, but no one was there. I was so lethargic that I turned off the lights and went back to sleep. However, moments later I heard a voice or an animal or some kind of demonic presence frantically growling in the hallway. The voice seemed to have come from the kitchen, so I instantly got up, took my baseball bat for self-defense, and slowly approached the kitchen. But as soon as I turned on the lights, there was nothing but silence. I tried calling my boyfriend on my cell phone, but he must have had it on, do not disturb, or was sound asleep since he wasn't picking up. And so I went back to my bedroom, made sure the door and windows were locked, and went to my bed, keeping the lights on. When morning came, I went to the kitchen and saw several articles of my clothing on the floor. I got dressed and immediately went to work with the mindset that I was definitely moving out. Come next morning, I told my co-workers about the ordeal, and they all vouched for me to call the cops, but I figured I would sound silly. Calling 911 on a ghost, I remembered asking my boyfriend to swing by after work and stay the night. As there was no way in hell, I was sleeping alone another night. When I arrived home, I remember hearing vague noises coming from my bedroom. I opened the door and could hear rattling in my closet. It sounded like a raccoon was rummaging in there. I shouted, who's there? Not expecting a response, but miraculously, a male voice answers me saying, oh, my name is Drew. I instinctively opened the door, revealing a man with long hair who was wearing all of my clothes, my socks, my shoes. 
and he had a book bag full of my clothing. Star Dolt, I said, who the hell are you and what the hell are you doing in my closet while discreetly snapping a picture of him to my boyfriend? The man then covered his crusty looking head with one of my hats and walked towards the bathroom outside. I followed him and saw him staring at the mirror saying, you're really pretty. Can I give you a hug? Get the hell out of her room or I'm calling the cops. That's when we both heard my boyfriend shouting from the parking lot, which caused the deranged man to flee the scene. We ended up calling the cops, which led law enforcement to arrest the man, a block away from the complex police. Say the man was charged with a misdemeanor and breaking and entering and an abundance of other felony charges. But what makes my skin crawl was how he had been living in my closet. For God knows how long, I'm just thankful that my boyfriend and I were lucky enough to not get killed in our sleep. I just hear rattling in my closet, like it sounds like a raccoon is in my closet, putting my hand on the knob. Now I'm like, who's in here? And if somebody answers me, he's like, oh, my name's Drew. I open the door and he's in there, wearing all of my clothes, my socks, my shoes, as a book bag full of my clothes. And he tries on my hat, goes my bathroom, looks in his, in the mirror, he asked like he was like, you're really pretty. Can I hug you all in? All I think the luckiest thing that ever happened to me in my life was being born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. From there, sharing a birthplace with the basketball legend LeBron James. I've been able to get closer to him than I bet most wannabe fans could ever dream of. But if you're really a fan like me, just living in the same city as the idol isn't enough. Cities are big places and elite men like LeBron James spend very little, if any time, amongst the masses. That's not a problem I face myself, however, because I know how to get close. It's all about those courtside seats they bring you so close to the players that you can very nearly feel the heat dissipating from their bodies. And every now and then you get lucky enough to trade a few words with one. Of them, LeBron, LeBron, I love you. LeBron, come over and have dinner with me. I'll cook for you. I know how you like your steaks. I'll do everything for you every time I meet with a family member. They ridicule me and chastise me about how much money I spend on getting those tickets at every home game. But they don't understand how important it is to me. It's not like I'm going broke over it anyway. I don't see what's wrong with it if I can afford it. I mean, some people spend their money on vacations and computers and clothes. And I spend my money on getting as near to LeBron James. I can, I would say it's like my hobby, but LeBron James more than anything, more than money and more than women is what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's hard for me to explain it. He's just so iconic. Everything he does just exudes badassery and confidence, virtue and compassion. He's like the greatest single specimen of a human being that's ever existed. He's indomitable on the court, undoubtedly a powerhouse in the gym and an angel and mortal coil everywhere else. Now people often call me biased. They say he's not the greatest who ever lived. Though we may be close and that I just feel that way because we're both Cleveland natives. Those people might be right, but it doesn't matter to me at all. LeBron and I have a history together. You know, his famous chalk throws where he throws a cloud of chalk into the air and watches it disappear with his fans. Whenever I'm court signed, I carry with me a big Ziploc bag that I coated with honey on the inside and wait for the throw while everyone else is stunned in slack-jawed amazement. You might see me on the cameras holding up an open bag with great pride, hoping to catch some of the chalk particles that have recently been graced by contact with the skin of LeBron James. Oh, his skin, how it contains such divinity. I'm proud to say that I myself have gone a step further from gathering his chalk, and I've actually touched the man himself. One night after the game, 
LeBron was doing a little photo op with some other fans. I saw him surrounded by a bunch of starving looking little kids in hospital gowns, and I struck while I had the chance. I still keep a print out of that photo on my nightstand. It's the first thing I see when I wake up, and the last thing I see before I sleep. But even the photo itself means little compared to the experience I had. Getting the phone, Hey LeBron, I'm your biggest groupie. I mean, fan fan. I hope you can hear my cheers amongst the calves. Fans, it's pretty good. But I know we can be much, much louder than any fan base. You know, in this league. Can I please take a picture with you? Hurry up, kid. You're not the only fan here. I was slick with it. I put my arm around his shoulder while we posed for the photo, and right after I snapped it before he could get away from me, I caressed the top of his head for just a moment. Oh, did that feel good, stroking the casing of that magnificent brain, feeling the hair and the grease transfer to my fingers. Even if those fibers didn't grow directly from his head, they still mingle with his scent and sweat and went along for the ride of a well-played match. I hate it when people make fun of his hairline, as if it makes him any less angelic. But anyway, I might have made a bad impression on LeBron on that occasion. Though I'm not really sure why, all I know is that he gave me a very strange look and walked away very suddenly, abandoning all those make-a-wish kids moments later. I was getting tossed around by a bunch of security meatheads who threw me out of the stadium and threatened to have me banned from all future games. Who do you think you are, man? Don't you have any respect? Get the hell out of here. Obviously, I couldn't get banned or my life would be over. So as much as it paid me, I took a back seat for a season, though. I saved a lot of money by not getting courtside seats. That season sucked. I was forced to watch him give love to all his other fans while I sat on the sidelines of the sidelines. It made me so angry. There was one occasion where LeBron almost ended our relationship altogether. He just finished scoring the winning baskets of a really tight game. And it was bad enough that I was forced to watch it from a thousand feet away. But afterwards, there was this whole celebration. In LeBron's honor, I wanted so bad to run out onto the court with him. But I just barely held myself back. But that's when I saw him do something that made my blood boil. He changed his shoes in Jersey and signed them and just gave them away to some homely-looking chubby kid. Afterwards, I found that ungrateful little snot and followed him out into the parking lot. I lured him away from the crowd, then demanded to have the shoes in Jersey. No way, man, I got these and they're mine. I'm gonna sell these for a fortune in ten years. Cram it, you little twerp. Those belong to me. Now I do regret the laying. This I went to, but I did what I had to do. I socked him right in the nose, hoping he would just crumble and pass out. But then he started screaming, oh, oh my God, what is wrong with you? That's when I knew I had to make sure he wouldn't be able to tattle, so I had to break his face just a little bit. Nobody was near the alley, so I had enough time to beat him to a juvenile palm. Take what belonged to me and get the hell out of there before anyone saw. Unfortunately, the little brats soiled both the jersey and the shoes by getting blood all over them and staining them. It's all right, though, because I wasn't planning on selling those. Ever. It was around that time, however, that tragedy struck for Cavalier fans. LeBron got traded and, of all places, to the Miami Heat. And no matter how hard I tried to swing it, I could just never afford courtside seats in Miami and plane tickets there and back. All the time, I'm ashamed to admit it. But there were a couple years when I didn't see LeBron at all. I'd forgiven him already, of course, and I had to make sure he knew that when he started becoming active on Instagram, I reached out to him. There, I sent him a message every day for a few months, but he never got back to me. I didn't have any followers, so I must have looked like a bot or some kind of scam or something. If he knew it was really me, I'm sure he would have responded. And even though LeBron eventually returned to Cleveland, I had to do something to make do during that time in between. At first, 
I built a little shrine dedicated to him, using all the little pieces of him that I've gathered over the years. My family thought it was a joke when I told them about it, but it's not. I was trying to find ways to legitimize it, and then one day, heaven delivered to me the perfect gift. I saw an ad from a LeBron James lookalike who was offering to do birthday parties for little kids while impersonating LeBron James. Obviously, I knew what I had to do because I knew the real LeBron would load to see such an imposter making money on his likeness. I lured the impersonator into a trap with relative ease. And now, with just a little bit of imagination, I have LeBron James in my basement whenever I want him. LeBron, you look enchanting this evening. Do you prefer red wine or white wine? I don't care. Please just let me out here. I won't tell anyone, I swear. Oh, Mr. James, you should really use your inside voice now. Where is your bag of chalk? Have you forgotten your before dinner ritual? Hmm, there are hundreds of doorbell video clips revolving around clowns, but the backstory behind this video has got to be the most disturbing here. You can see the clown in front of a house while holding what appears to be a large kitchen knife. The following story portrays a dramatized reenactment of the encounter. Here's what the story looked like in the last several years. It felt like a lot of the big dramas and outrages have been started by what are called jokes, by the people that are saying and doing the things that are getting negative attention. Historically, you'd find a guy like me sticking to the side of let people joke how they want and don't get offended. If you personally don't find it funny, quite a few people have tried to persuade me out of believing this. Some of them were level heads, just trying to get me to understand why people are sensitive to some things, but others were a little more aggressive in their statements. To me, of course, I never really listened to the people who were trying to have a productive conversation. I genuinely loved to jump into the fray and troll people who I thought were taking their opinions a bit too seriously. And I wasn't just this way online. The digital presence of a troll that I put up was an extension of who I was in real life. But I always knew that most people would describe me as having an attitude problem, being a little crass or just a jerk. I didn't mind being seen that way, it was all verbal stuff. Anyway, I never threatened to hurt anyone physically. But the thing about always being negative like that is, well, it builds up a lot of bad karma, as I've come to learn. And eventually, all this bad karma caught up to me. I never saw it coming. But once it happened, I started reflecting on my actions and how they got me in that situation. It was all pretty obvious on Fridays. I didn't have work, so I'd always get a head start on my weekend. I spent most Fridays lounging around my house and doing some chores at a very leisurely pace, sometimes pre-gaming for the parties I was going to find myself at. Come night time, this was one of those occasions in which I started getting rowdy. Pretty early in the day, I was getting my mail around 3 p.m., a drink in one hand as I stepped out the front door to check the box. I remember being rather annoyed with the bills I received in the mail that day. I'd gotten a ticket for running a red light, which arrived at the same time as my utility bill and Hawaii, dues notice, so quite a few expenses popping. All at once, like that soured my mood. Pretty bad, that's when I saw one of the neighborhood kids biking down the road, probably going home from school. I saw that kid a lot. My house must have been on his commute to school. From time to time, I'd call out to him and try to make some jokes, but he never seemed to appreciate them. He'd always give me the evil eye, or throw me the bird, or just ride on by, pretending he didn't hear me on this particular day. He looked worn out, dejected, seemed like the perfect target for a little joshing around. I took a guess as to what was messing with him and tried to dig at it. Yo, kid, maybe if you ditched the raggedy old bike and got a car, that girl wouldn't have curved you so bad. Suddenly, the kid did something. I didn't expect he hit the brakes hard and skidded to a stop, swinging out his back tire and looking straight at me. 
Maybe if you got a life in minding your own business, I wouldn't have to take you down a peg. What does that even mean, kid? You can't say weird stuff like that. You'll never make any friends that you better sleep with. One eye open jerk, wad in the moment. I couldn't help but laugh. A threat never feels emptier than when it shouted at you from someone ten years younger than you on a bicycle. However, though I guess I can never prove it, I'm pretty sure that threat was real. A night or two later, I slept soundly. I didn't give any mind to that kid. I have about 15 security cameras and a bunch of high-powered floodlights all around the exterior of my house, which I had installed for reasons you could expect for someone in my personality. I always knew my antics could create enemies who might want to try and get back at me through my house, but I never thought the cameras would capture something as strange as they did when I awoke the next morning. I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong every time I rounded a corner in my house. I got the chills, and I couldn't tell why, to alleviate my suspicions. I decided to check the security footage from the previous night, thinking there would be nothing of any concern. I was wrong late in the middle of the night. Around two in the morning, an unidentified figure approached my house. He or she was dressed in a clown costume, looking just like one of those creepy killer clown sickos from all those weird videos that were surfacing in 2016. They were armed with a ridiculously long knife which they brandished in front of the cameras. First, they snuck up to my front door and tried to open jostling the handle to see if it was locked. Of course it was locked and they weren't able to get in from there. The microphone on my doorbell overheard their deranged conversation with themselves. You locked the door. How dare you? I know you can see me through your little camera. You vermin, take all the screenshots and footage that you want. This won't be the last time you see this face. Even as they talked to themselves like a crazy person, they were extremely quiet. Still, the motion sensors on the floodlights lit them up. All the same, this clown character wasn't spooked by the lights. However, they seemed to be familiar with the layout of my house, like they'd seen it before. They did an entire lap around it, checking the lock on every single window and door, peering inside and scratching the walls with their knife. He really dodged a bullet, or should I say a knife. But the weirdest part is, as quietly as they appeared, they also just left. It's very disturbing to know that I was completely unaware of all this. As it was happening, I have an alarm system in my house. But all I would have taken was one unlocked door to give them enough time to sneak in and slip my throat before I'd even woken up. It's pretty embarrassing, honestly. I can't say for sure, but based on when this all happened and how popular those killer clown videos were with high schoolers at the time, it makes perfect sense to me that the one kid on the bike would be the culprit. But again, I wasn't 100. Sure, the fact that he strolled around the perimeter of the house made it seem as if it wasn't his first visit. But for the first few days, I didn't connect those dots and I was worried half to death that I was being stalked by a real sicko after seeing the footage. I really did sleep with one eye open for a few weeks. Just goes to show you should be careful who you mess with. It certainly taught me a bit about who I choose to make jokes about and when I know it's punching down to mess with a high schooler. But that doesn't mean the kid can't be dangerous. I mean, the kind of kid who would do something like this, just for getting teased, is the same kind of kid who might just snap on a whole different day in a much worse way, given a different situation. She this hands down has got to be the most creepiest story on the channel. Sometimes kid drawings could look innocent, but when you dive into the true meaning behind the drawing, discover some terrifying things here. You see an innocent looking cat. But when you see what happens at the end of the story, you may question your sanity. Here's what it looked like. Most kids develop strange habits. At some point during their childhood, imaginary friends, eccentric rituals, or other strange compulsive behaviors, they can be brought on by just about anything. And the only limit is the imagination of the child. So I'm sure you can imagine my bewilderment 
when my teenage daughter started seeing the ghost of our recently deceased cat. Now, the teenage years of a kid's life is about the time when they start finding reasons to be mad and indignant with authority as they begin to voice their disagreements with their parents. But all that stuff is usually over things like curfews and bedtimes and chores. Not about a disagreement over whether or not the cat is still alive. I knew that cat was dead for a fact. I was the one who tried to catch it when it broke out of the house and ran out in front of a speeding car getting itself turned to roadkill. I was the one who scraped it off the street, buried it in the backyard. Despite that, my daughter managed to find a way to blame me for the cat's death because I scared it or something. I didn't care, though I didn't get mad back or anything like that, because on a deeper level I understood what my daughter was going through, and to some extent, I did agree that some of her stress was my fault. I'd recently taken a new job opportunity that required my family to move to a different city. My daughter detested this because she had been very involved with her old school. I felt bad, so I tried to make it up to her. I bought her a phone and a desktop computer for her room so she could stay in touch with her old friends over that internet thing the kids were all talking about. My wife and I even took her to the pound and let her pick out a cat for us to adopt. These things combined seemed to do the trick with keeping our daughter happy. However, when the cat died, things became worse than ever. At first, it just seemed like she was not properly processing the grief. For a few days, she didn't say anything. She didn't go to school. All she did was draw. I'd go into a room from time to time to remind her to study and stay caught up. But it was like she didn't even notice my presence. She just kept drawing pictures of the cat, like a little kid with a brand new box of crayons. Wood, except her drawings of the cat, were actually pretty good. When she finally started talking again, my wife and I wanted to celebrate, but we couldn't because our daughter wasn't talking to us. She was talking to the cat. I'm so glad you came back. Precious, you really are precious, aren't you? Yes, you are. Who are you talking to, Sweeney? I'm talking to Precious. Obviously, she came back. I guess that means you have to start buying cat food again. Don't forget, she's so hungry. My wife and I were taken aback. Our daughter had never had an imaginary friend before, so it was that much stranger to see her develop one now. Or at least, that's the way things looked. We tolerated the strangeness for the time being. However, as our daughter at least seemed to be happier, she started to go back to school again, which we felt was good. The only problem was that when she came home from school every day, she would start doing her old routine of taking care of the cat, dishing out some food and water, petting it and talking to it and carrying it around, except there was nothing there, she was just pantomiming. Still, we appeased her and got a few cans of cat food, thinking that she would surely come to her senses at any moment. But that's not what happened. We watched her set the food out, and the next day would be gone. We didn't have a dog, so to us there was only one explanation. Wendy, we need to talk. We've noticed that you've been talking to yourself lately, and we're worried and about the cat food. You haven't been eating it, have you? Oh my god. No, what do you need glasses? Precious has been eating it. Obviously, but Precious isn't here anymore. Sweetheart, she's not coming back. What do you mean? She's right here in my arms. You guys are so blind, I can't stand you. My wife and I just didn't have a clue on what to do that night. I was losing sleep, stuck awake, worrying that my daughter had gone crazy. That's when I heard a noise from downstairs that sounded exactly like a cat sharpening their claws, tearing up some fabric my wife had managed to get to sleep, so I dared not ruin her rest. I jumped up out of bed and threw on my robe and walked downstairs by myself. I found the back of the living room sofa had been torn to shreds, like a neurotic feline with abandonment issues had been locked in there alone. I was immediately flushed with a mixture of frustration and horror. Then a door. Upstairs, slam. 
slammed shut. I knew that it was my daughter's room. I rushed upstairs, but instead of barging into a room, I stalled. I saw two shadows shifting in the light, spilling out from beneath the door. I heard my daughter talking to herself again, but this time I heard meowing in response. I quietly shuffled up to the door and put my ear against it. I swear I could hear purring when I thought I'd heard enough. I swung open the door, somehow thinking that I'd see some random stray cat living in my daughter's room. But of course, there was nothing. She was just laying on her bed, acting like she was holding something, petting it and smiling at it and kissing it. I gasped in complete shock at the sight of my daughter acting like a schizophrenic. Wendy jumped up in surprise when she noticed me. What are you doing? Haven't you heard of knocking? What, but what are you doing? It's a school night. You should be sleeping at a loss for words to say or actions to take. I very awkwardly retreated back through the doorway and gently closed the door. I listened in again, but she turned the light off and didn't make any more noise the next day after I'd gotten home from work and Wendy was back from school. I thought I'd try something. I found a camera I'd gotten from a relative the previous Christmas. A regular old film camera with most of the shots left in it, from the first film reel we'd ever loaded into it. So Wendy, I know we've been having some disagreements about Precious. You believe she's still around, and your mother and I believe that she isn't. I thought of a good way that we could find out. Once and for all, who's really right with pictures? Okay, let me go get her. She left the room to retrieve the cat, returning with her arms stretched out in a weird position as though she was holding a fully grown house cat. She smiled and I framed up the camera, then snapped the picture when the flash went off, along with the click of the mirrors inside the camera. Wendy flinched and dropped her arms. Oh no, that scared her. She ran off in pursuit of the phantom feline. I wasn't able to get Wendy to take any more pictures with the cat. Apparently it was thoroughly frightened by the sight and sound of the camera. One was all I needed though. I took the film roll to the photo lab and had it developed as soon as possible. I waited until my wife and my daughter were both home. Before opening the envelope we were all sitting on the couch together when it was revealed. Wendy was ecstatic to this day. I still can't explain it. I've stopped trying to the picture. I took, even though I saw that there was no cat. When I took that photo, the photo itself contained a flawless image of Precious sprawled out in my daughter's arms, exactly the way it would have been if it had really been there. This image is allegedly the same image taken by the family of the daughter and her quote-unquote invisible cat when the family got the picture developed. This is what they found. This is just downright terrifying as the cat seemingly appears in the girl's hands, despite nothing being there when the photo was taken. As much as I walked my house and make sure doors and stuff will lock. But the sad part about it is, I was locking this man in the house with us. The decisions you make as a teenager can influence the course of your life in ways you won't be thinking about while you're making them. You may not even realize that you're making a huge decision, but it doesn't matter because the consequences of your actions as a naive kid have a huge effect on the rest of your life, despite whether you realize it in the moment or not. Like when I was in high school, I made the decision to not care about class so I could care about messing around with boys. But aside from the obvious about what happens when you mess around with boys, it's the immature men you're forming relationships with at formative times in your life that can also stick around with you. For many years, one deadbeat in particular comes to mind. I don't want just anyone knowing his identity, so I'll just call him Chris. We were both each other's first, so it felt special. At the time, we didn't really know each other deep down, we were just getting down. He got me pregnant while we were still kids ourselves, and because we didn't think school's worth the time we spent in it, we both dropped out and tried to move in together. I couldn't find a job as a pregnant high school dropout, and he couldn't find a job because he was dumb as a sack of potatoes, which I unfortunately didn't realize until I tried to build a life with him. 
It didn't take long before the little money we had ran out and things got desperate at that point. I was about to do the smart thing, admit failure, and plead with Mom to let me move back in. But Chris wasn't able to admit defeat. Instead, he resorted to crime. At first, he was just breaking into cars, but it didn't take long before... graduated to breaking into houses, but like I said, he's stupid, so he got caught when I had to talk to him on the other side of bulletproof glass. That's when I knew it was time to break things off with him. My baby wasn't even born yet, but I knew the child would be better off never learning anything from his father. Twelve years. Chris, really, your son will almost be a man. Before you can shake your hand, you'll wait for me. Though, won't you, baby? We'll get through this, right? Yeah. Okay, you wish I'm not waiting for anybody. I'm gonna go on and live my life, ain't no way. I'm gonna lose 12 years over your mistakes, so you're just gonna forget about me. I was gonna be your husband. Wake up, Chris. We were never in love. We were just being stupid. And look where it got us. In the months that passed after I became pregnant, I think I matured a lot. Chris, on the other hand, hadn't changed a bit. He was still just a boy on the inside. The look on his face when I told him it was over between us. I came to recognize it in my son as the look of a fussy toddler not getting what he wants. Screw you, then I hate you. Just throw it all away. Throw away everything I did. Everything I did for you, for our kids, for our family. Just throw it in the gutter, that's where you belong anyways. You stupid, or seeing that whole scene with his little temper tantrum, with all those other inmates and family members around us, just made me see Chris more clearly than I ever had before. That sort of behavior just isn't acceptable for a grown man to display, and I wasn't going to subject myself to any more of it. I walked right out of there and never looked back, and I got on with my life. Whenever Chris sent me letters from prison, I just returned them to sender unopened with the words, no or never, or get lost scribbled on the back. I learned a lot from my mistakes, but nobody's perfect. Fast forward 12 years to today, I got four kids and my baby sister's boy living in my house, but I still never found a man that was worth keeping. I guess I inherited a bad taste in men from my mother. However, my life is still going on, and I'm still dealing with the consequences of my actions as a teenager in ways I never thought could be possible. A strange thing started happening in my house. I kept hearing what sounded like a family of raccoons running around in my attic, but every time I tried to listen for it, I wouldn't be able to make it out. I'd be falling asleep, and I'd feel droplets of water fall on my face from the vent above my head. When I got up and checked the vent for condensation, it would be dry as a bone. My baby sister, who only passes through the house from time to time, tried to convince me that it was just the sort of sounds that old houses tend to make. But that never sat right with me. I lived there for years and never heard anything like that. That's what made me think there was some kind of animal living in the walls or attic somewhere. But after a few days, even stranger things started happening. Things I didn't think any animal could cause. At random times, I'd hear a loud thud or snap from the attic. Like the trusses and beams were cracking and falling apart. But the thing that sent me into a frenzy was the nails. One night, I was lying awake in bed waiting for water to drip down from the vent. But instead of water, the nails holding the vent of the ceiling popped right out and landed on me, one right after another. That's when I was sure there was some kind of ghost living in the house and I couldn't take it anymore. I had to know what it was, but there was no way I was going up there. But that's what kids are for. I sent my nephew and oldest son at the ladder to the attic with a couple flashlights and told them to tell me what they saw. They were up there for about 10 seconds before they came running down, screaming and crying. Mommy, mommy, there's a man. There's a man up there who says he's my daddy. For a moment, I was in disbelief, shock. But then I saw the man rushing down the ladder. He got to the bottom and looked me in the eyes and who else would it be? 
but Chris fresh out of prison from just two weeks ago. I didn't even have to say anything. The look in my eyes was enough to send him running like a child, trying to get away from the whip. The problem with that, though, is that, for all the cops say about how good they are at their jobs, they still haven't found the full. Which means I have to worry about extra security. I've since become extremely paranoid and afraid to go to sleep. I lay in bed at night thinking that somehow, Chris is still in the house somewhere. She had just put her children to bed when she heard a thumping coming from the attic area above her room. A few minutes later, that's when the nails started popping out of the ceiling. One by one, it was just like bing, 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 bing. Thinking it was an animal, she called her older sons and nephew to go check it out. My nephew was like... Well, if there's something up there, then it's coming down. But what they found up those stairs still gives everyone in the house the chills. That's when they found him, the guy sleep inside of my heating unit. He had packed coats and stuff in the heating unit. Now this story may sound over the top, but believe me, sometimes stories like these are not as unusual as you think. There have been many outlandish surgical modifications that people have done to themselves, but this one may outweigh everything you've seen on the internet. More details will be disclosed at the end of the story. Everyone knows that bosses can be a major pain in someone's life. The archetype of a crass, penny-pinching employers. So universal that it became a major character in Spongebob, a cartoon that defined a generation and continues to be relevant and inspiring to this day. Despite being over 20 years old at this point, and while I'm sure many people out there do from time to time derisively refer to their boss as a real-life Mr. Krabs, I very seriously doubt that anyone has truly experienced a boss so unwittingly faithful to the character that they could actually earn the title that is, except for me and my co-workers. I've worked at a Red Lobster ever since I got out of college, and the man who used to run the restaurant was as close to being the real-life Mr. Krabs as any human being could possibly get, both in personality and physiology. He always had a pear-shaped body and big old meat hooks for hands, but the real similarities had started with his business practices. He was a man of strict morals, to say the least. Not wholesome or virtuous morals, However, they were purely financially driven, but he stuck to them like rubber and glue. He was the biggest cheapskate I've ever met in my life. All the staff worked for minimum wage, and he never gave a single one of us a raise, except for what marginal increases were literally required by law. Every year, he also made sure that nobody ever worked more than 40 hours a week, because the concept of overtime pay probably would have given him an aneurysm if he actually had to shell it out. Thankfully, it went both ways. If he ever caught a customer about to leave a tip of less than five dollars, he'd sit there and chew them out, blocking their exit, until they were so embarrassed that they'd end up leaving 30%. Excuse me, lad, but are you royalty? Do you think me hard-working employees have served you and cater to your every need for over an hour out of the kindness of their hearts because you're special? No. They're working and your paying service is not free, and it's worth more than three measly dollars. It was honestly quite the spectacle, for all I can say about his economic prudence, though. He wasn't bad at running the business at all. Actually, after working there for about a year or so, I finally had an idea of how to put my business degree to good use. Since I had been collecting dust for some time, I decided to reach out to old Mr. Krabs and ask to be trained as a manager in the hopes of one day owning my own restaurant, or maybe even taking up ownership of the Red Lobster. Someday he laughed off the idea of me replacing him, but he was receptive to me training for management, 
but unfortunately it was around that time that he took me on as a pseudo-apprentice that I started to learn some of his stranger habits. We'd always jokingly called him Mr. Krabs because of his money-loving attitude, but we were surprised when he seemed to revel in the nickname we thought it might be. Because of the fact that Red Lobster is an establishment that specializes in selling crabs and other shellfish, and he might be interpreting the nickname as a recognition of his ability as a boss. But I came to learn that was not it at all. So, me lad, you want me to teach you the ins and outs of the restaurant business? Good workers are hard to come by, but you've proven yourself. I'll tell you my secret. Come with me, uh, all right, sir. He took me to the lobster tank at the front of the restaurant. It was early in the morning before opening, so the tank was packed full of lobsters. He stooped down and pressed his face up against the glass. You see these babies, these puppies are my money makers. But they're more than just that. I've always loved the ocean's creepy crawlies. You see crabs, lobsters, shrimps, they just understand me. People always want all that huggy, kissy crap. These little guys just pinch. That's all they do is pinch. Isn't that right? You little cretins. You don't care about nothing, do you? Wouldn't. You just love to clip the nose right off my face. You see, Rick, the lobsters need to be taken care of or they won't taste good. The crabs come in frozen, so they're low maintenance. But the lobsters are special. My whole world got turned upside down in that moment. I always thought that he had a wife or something that he could go home to and drop the crabbiness. But it was then that I realized that lobsters and crabs were like this man's spirit animals, and the only thing he loved more than keeping them around and babying them like pets was when he got to have them killed and cooked and dismembered to make him money. I didn't learn anything useful about how to run a business from any of that, but it was informative in a different way. This guy's straight up nuts. I thought to myself as I awkwardly smiled at him and backed away slowly to the kitchen to start my shift in secret. I spread the word around about how infatuated the boss was with the company, Shellfish, and unsurprisingly this only cemented his identity as the real-life Mr. Krabs. However, as harmless as this seemed, initially it became a problem. One day the lobster tank is where we keep all the lobsters that we cook and serve to customers, so there's always members of the kitchen staff reaching in and grabbing them. For this reason, there's no lid on the tank. That in turn is one of the reasons why there's always a staff member somewhere around the tank to make sure nothing stupid happens to it. That employee is usually the host or hostess, since they're at the front most of the time. Anyway, there was one particular occasion in which we just hired a new hostess, who wasn't very assertive. I think it was her first job or something, because she was always very nervous and soft-spoken. So when some bone-headed teenager thought it would be funny to stick his hands in the lobster tank, while the hostess wouldn't be plain if cries did little, if anything at all. The next person to catch the kid in the act was the boss man himself. Oh my gosh, don't do that. Please stop it. Get your grubby Mitch enemy lobster tank, you lanky boo-licking ravisher. I heard his screams from across the restaurant and rushed to the scene. The boss was holding a meat tenderizer for some reason, and I saw in his eyes that he was about to lunge. I acted quickly, holding him back as he swung the hammer around trying to hit the kid in the face. The kid realized he'd gotten in over his head, so he and all his friends rushed out of there, blushing and snickering. I did my best to calm him down, but he was mad like some kind of overprotective father. It took a while to get the murder out of his eyes. We managed to keep the incident from being reported to corporate, but we all knew that something had to be done. I had the idea of taking over running the restaurant for a few weeks while he went on vacation. Perhaps I've been taking all this lobster business too seriously. I guess it would be good to take some time off for myself. 
All right, I'm leaving the restaurant to you, Rick. I trust you now. So don't do me wrong, this place better be in ship shape when I get back. Sure thing, Mr. Krabs. I mean, sir, when he left. Every single employee breathed a deep sigh of relief. No longer would there be a gruff and tolerable man breathing down our necks, micromanaging us and criticizing us. With me on top, that place became peaceful and serene while still running like a well-oiled machine. Granted, I hadn't hired any of those workers, but lo and behold, I didn't have to become Mr. Krabs to be a good boss to them. Things went on like that for about a month before we got word from the man he texted me early one morning and said he would be returning after. Close that night, I worked everyone a little bit harder to make sure everything was clean and organized. For his return, I was actually kind of nervous. I'd enjoyed being the man on top and didn't really feel ready to relinquish the position just yet. So after everything closed up, I waited in his office and tried to think up a pitch. I could give him that could keep me as the weekend manager or something like that. But when he arrived, all that went out the window. He walked through the door looking downright grotesque. His hands had been surgically disfigured to look like the pincers of a lobster. There were a natural protrusion sticking out of his head that were meant to look like antennae, and he even tattooed his eyes black to look like the beady eyeballs of a lobster. Long time no see me, lad. What the hell happened to you? Oh, this. It's called the Krukenberg procedure. Google it. I had a black market doctor doing pretty neat. Right? The next story was inspired by one of the most bizarre ring camera footages ever recorded. It's been quite the hot topic when it comes to doorbell footage, as the behavior from this estranged man leaves you wondering what his motive was. More coverage on this incident will be disclosed at the end of the story. Here's what the story looked like. I had a 9 to 5 job at the mall as a salesperson, so it was incredibly exhausting at times. Also, I'm a married woman and my family, and I just moved into a new home. The front yard was always well taken care of by my dear husband. He was always meticulous about it, but... After living there for a month or two, there was a foul smell that I couldn't understand where it was coming from. It smelled like crap, which didn't make sense because we had no pets at home. My husband had long been allergic to cats and dogs, and unfortunately, our kids inherited this from their father. At first, I wondered if it was the result of a curious and troublesome raccoon that somehow climbed up the walls. There were times when I would ring the doorbell alerting my husband and kids to open the door and would notice a wet and slimy substance on the doorbell. When I had told my husband about the slime, he reckoned that it could have been snails that would crawl up the wall every now and then, but neither of us took the time to confirm our theories because we had more important things to do. So I got used to wiping it off. Every time I arrived home from work one day, when I got home my nose had caught a putrid scent swimming in the air along the front yard. It was terrible. It smelled like urine. I searched for the source, and soon enough I found myself facing one side of the wall with dried yellow stains that defiled the elegant white hues, which were meant to make the walls look clean. I just encountered a highly irrational customer at work, so coming home to this made me furious. Instead of using the doorbell, I banged the door. I heard someone scurry to the door, and when it opened I saw my husband holding what appeared to be a crowbar behind his back and said, What the hell, Mary? I thought you were some kind of wacko. What's the problem? What's the problem? Are you seriously asking me that could you not see nor smell what is outside our house? You're the one who tends to the front yard most of the time. Right, I replied, my mind full of stress. I was in my office upstairs all day. Honey, what are you talking about? My husband said, bewildered and somewhat piqued. Yeah, 
right. Was it you or the kids who took a piss on the wall in our front yard? Tell me it felt like a tsunami of negative emotions had overflowed after keeping them in for so long at work. When the kids heard me yelling, they immediately came to the front door, and one of them asked Mommy, What's wrong? Since my boys did misbehave from time to time, I grabbed them by the arms and said, One of you peed on the wall outside our house. Do you boys think it's funny staining the wall like that? Or were you too busy playing outside that you wouldn't use our restroom? Huh, who was it? Both of them cried, begging me to let them go. And then my husband intervened, forcing his way between the kids and I. What's the matter with you, huh? None of us went outside today, okay? The kids were upstairs playing the whole time. Are you happy now? My husband replied, wrapping his arms around the kids. After releasing my anger, I showed my husband where I saw the yellow stains and made him clean it all up. I still suspected that one of my kids did it, and that my husband and children decided to keep it from me. The kids cowered in fear at the corner of the room as I glared at them angrily. Stay in your room. You're both grounded, shedding tears. The two boys nodded the following day. I encountered the same thing upon arriving home. The smell of crap lingered in the air once again with more slime on the doorbell and urine on the wall. There seemed to also be a disgusting white substance dripping down the wall, almost like someone had sneezed creating a big blob of snot. As a result, I threw up unable to control myself any longer. I went inside the house and all hell broke loose. I toppled tables and chairs and shattered drinking glasses and bowls on the floor. Who the heck is doing this? I demanded the truth. My husband ran downstairs and gasped upon seeing the Messiah contrived. Following this incident, we decided we best have a ring camera installed in and out of the house. Since then, all the slime, urine, and putrid smell simply vanished. Whoever was responsible for this was clearly aware of her cameras and was afraid for the next couple of days. I felt relieved I was convinced that we had finally dealt with the issue once and for all. A week later, my husband and I visited relatives who invited us for dinner. This was a particular occasion where we had to leave the kids at home since we'd be coming home very late. Everything was going smoothly. I had the chance to unwind and catch up with my cousins, aunts and uncles. However, moments later, my phone kept ringing incessantly. For the first five minutes, I simply shrugged it off. But when it lasted for about 15 minutes, I finally checked my phone and realized I was getting notifications from my ring security camera at home. Upon clicking the notification and seeing the live footage, I saw a man licking the doorbell. He wore what looked like a jacket over a button-up shirt. He had short hair, a big nose, a mustache, and a beard, but I didn't recognize this man at all. It wasn't only the licking that bothered me. like he was making love with the doorbell and that completely freaked me out. I honestly couldn't believe what I was witnessing, but what was even more frightening was that our kids were left alone at home. I immediately called the police when my husband frantically drove us back home, along with three of my uncle's thoughts of the stranger entering our house and stabbing the kids with a kitchen knife. Terrified me when my husband noticed my anxiety, he held my hand and asked me to have faith upon arriving home. The man was no longer there. All that remained was his saliva on the doorbell, his urine on the wall, and that strange white substance. Well prepared to be seriously grossed out. Here residents are reeling after a man was caught on camera licking a California family's doorbell. Yeah. Police say that the suspect spent three hours licking the doorbell and milling around the family's yard. The security camera captured the incident and notified the owners who were out of town. Authorities say the footage helped them identify the suspect. They are still looking for the man, but say that he could face a number of charges. He's removed all the insulation from, the, from my ceiling above the bedroom and that gives him direct access where he could manipulate and get his way into the vents. In 
real estate, they have this saying, location. Location, location, meaning the location of a property is the single most important aspect. Always my family learned that the hard way, just how quickly one bad neighbor could turn a dream home into a nightmare. I don't want to give away exactly where we live, so I can't say what city we're in, but I can say that it has a really enchanting historical district with lots of brick and mortar industrial era buildings. For as long as we've been together, my wife and I have always wanted to live in one of those old fashioned townhomes that were renovated from closed down factories and mills and things like that. So when we got married and worked our jobs for a few years and saved up enough money, we went and bought one. Almost everything about the property was perfect. The only problem was our next door neighbor. We shared one side of our town home with his, and even though ours was pristine, his was less than. So, to be completely frank, he was an embarrassing dump to live next to. He lived alone and always claimed to be in the process of renovations whenever we got the chance to talk to him, which was rare despite all of those problems with our neighbor. We felt like we couldn't be upset with him or snotty about any of it. After all, he was an elderly man who probably lost his wife a few years back, so there was pity in our hearts for him. All in all, however, we hardly saw him, so we paid him no mind. My wife and I had our own lives to get on with, and within a year or so we had our first child, not long after our daughter was born. We started to see our neighbor more often. That's a beautiful child you have there. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. At first, we figured that seeing the birth of a new life had sparked some new life within him as well, but that didn't last long. Once we started to get really familiar with his habits, we'd catch him peeking through his window at us while we were coming home from a walk with our baby, but he didn't come out to talk to us. Most of the time, he just watched, and it was right about that time that the house started making sounds that it had never made before. All old buildings make noises at night, but after a few weeks, you get completely used to them. It's extremely unsettling when you start hearing an all-new array of bumps in the night. Over a year after you've moved in, I've had raccoon and rat problems before. It's creepy, the scuttling and scratching, the little squeaks and grunts. But this was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. And what was worse was that the noises were disturbing my daughter's sleep, causing her to wake up screaming and crying a lot more often than either me or my wife thought little babies were supposed to. I remember scheduling an appointment with an exterminator and having to take a day off work to wait for them to arrive. Of course, they crawled all over the attic and didn't find any evidence of an infestation. I starkly remember having the observation in that moment. However, while the inspector was fumbling around in the attic, the noises he was making sounded almost identical to the noises I kept hearing every night. The thought gave me chills, so when the inspector left, I followed him out. The door waved him off, then got a few minutes of fresh air there on the steps while holding my daughter. Then, for the first time in weeks, my neighbor came out to say hello. You know, my grandson is coming over for his birthday soon. He's about your daughter's age. Maybe they can get along with a late. Tell play date. No, that's okay, thank you. I don't think she's quite ready for socializing yet. She's still very colicky and we don't know why. Besides, my wife and I are both very busy with work. Oh, do you need a babysitter? Then I'm retired and I've got life insurance and social security checks coming in. You wouldn't have to pay me. I just love to see children grow up. No, no, we're okay. We have it all covered. We appreciate it. Though just then, my daughter started to fuss, crying the way she did when she woke up at night. I caught the neighbor staring at her, but it didn't feel right. Most of the time, old people stare at babies with warm faces and big smiling eyes. But the way he looked at her wasn't like that, and really none of what he had said lined up at all. I never saw anybody but him go in or out of that place. A chill ran down my spine along with a realization. 
I rushed inside my house and locked the door. That night I was telling my wife about my suspicions while we were lying in bed. I hate to say this, honey, but I think our neighbor is getting into our attic. What would make you say something like that? Don't try to give me nightmares. It's just a feeling I have, call it intuition. I wouldn't say it and freak you out if I didn't really think it was happening. Oh my god, look at that. He's got a flashlight. I shot up out of bed and pointed at the ceiling to where the heating pipe ran up out of our room and into the attic was a light shining through the crack that shifted around too irregularly to be anything but a person swinging around a handheld light. I knew in that moment that somebody was up there and I could hear them too, but I wasn't prepared to go up there and confront him. We were scared. Instead, the very next day I told my wife to take our daughter and stay with a member of our family. I went out and bought a couple security cameras and placed them in the attic. What I saw sickens me to this day and fills me with a violent, instinctual rage. There he was, that old creep crawling around in my attic, drilling holes in my walls, spying on my family. I had no idea how long he'd been doing this, but I didn't care. Knowing it happened once was bone-chilling enough, but having reason to believe it had become a routine was downright mind-shattering. I called the cops and had him arrested immediately. As of now, I'm still in the legal battle with him, but you can rest assured that a man like me will protect his family, and I will not rest until that snake is rotting in prison. All these years, we have no idea what's been going on inside of our own home, an alleged peeping. Tom was caught on camera and is now facing charges. Police say the suspect was able to sneak into his neighbor's attic and watch the man, his wife, and his baby through events the victim put cameras in his attic. Out of attic, after hearing noises above his bedroom and seeing some lights that were flashing in the vents. I lived in a small rural town for most of my life. It's the kind of area where everybody knows each other, despite there being miles between most neighbors. I also got a job at just about the only restaurant within a 30-mile radius of my house, the old-fashioned Dairy Queen at the intersection of the two country highways that went through town. The town was so small, in fact, if you needed anything else other than gas mail or fast food, you'd have to drive 45 minutes to the next sign of civilization. Since the town I lived in was so small, the business that the Dairy Queen received was minimal. At best, it was usually only one person working on any given shift. The manager actually only had two other people on staff, other than himself, me for the morning shift, and another guy for the evening shift on average. During those days, I probably served about three customers per shift. The owner of the franchise knew all of this. Without a doubt, I always remember him as this depressed old husk of a businessman with his life's work crumbling away. Before his eyes, he never tried to hide the fact that he wanted to sell the business, but for the longest time, he couldn't find anyone who wanted to buy it. For obvious reasons, but that all changed very suddenly. One day, the boss man came into work, and for the first time ever, there was a smile on his face. I'm finally doing it sport. I'm throwing in the towel, I'm selling this old hunk of junk, and getting it off my hands, really. How who's the buyer? I don't really know, actually. I met him on Craigslist. He said he's a professional savior of failed businesses, probably some kind of cartel money. Launderer says, only do cash. No questions asked. Watch your back around him, all right. All right, man, I don't think anybody's going to be able to save this place, though. Well, you see, that's the beauty of the situation. That's not my problem anymore. True good luck in your future endeavors. I guess you too, sport. I'm just gonna clear out my office. And the new guy will be in tomorrow. He said he's bringing his business partner. Whoever that is, I couldn't care less, the wife and kids. And I are moving to Florida and getting the hell out of this country hellhole. You should do the same. I know I always said you were my last hope for this place. But you're too young to be tied down to a place like this. Don't do what I did, kid. Those were the last words he ever said to me. 
they rang out in my head. I couldn't stop thinking about them for the rest of my shift, and even through the night. But I wanted to stay for a little longer, if nothing else, than to see what this new guy would be like, and what his plans were for revitalizing the business. To say I was shocked when they arrived the following morning would be a gross understatement. For one thing, the businessman's partner was a son, and the relation was obvious, because they both gave me chills every time I made eye contact with them. I know I'm a country bumpkin or whatever, but these guys were a whole different kind of isolated from society. It was like there was some genetic cross between trailer trash and mountain man, and then inbred for three generations. You'll be working up front with my son, Blake. I'll take care of everything on the back end. You shouldn't have to do anything different that didn't make me feel any better about their business prospects. I couldn't imagine what one person could do to save a business without working their employees at least a little differently. But at least the new boss could speak. I couldn't say the same for his son, Blake, and all the hours I worked with him. He never said a word. He must have been legitimately mute. He was able to do everything the job required, except for the part where you have to speak to people, but he was never reprimanded for this, and I didn't want to accost a disabled person, so I just worked around it. However, very much, despite all these strange aspects of the new management, they were successful, unreasonably successful in a matter of weeks. The flow of business through the DQ went from its initial trickle to a slow and steady stream to an absolute madhouse. Every day, the weird thing about it was that nobody was ordering anything but blizzards. The number of blizzards I served in a day increased from three or four to three or four hundred, while the grill was never even turned on. Of course, I knew something had changed about the soft serve, and I had to know what the first time I tried a blizzard from this new guy's recipe. I was blown away. Don't get me wrong, all blizzards are pretty good. But this stuff was like crack. It was sweet, savory, salty and creamy in all the right proportions, like some master chef stuff. After that, I wasn't surprised when I saw the business continue to grow with the lines forming around the building, even drawing in people from other nearby towns, people I'd never seen in my 18 years in the area. But when I dared to ask what had changed, I was met with intense secrecy. Why do you want to know? Huh? So you can steal my secret formula, sell it to my competitors, use them against me in your little business attempt, Back off, Squirt. You're just a service associate. You don't need to know. And if you ask me again, or if I catch you trying to find out, I'll turn you into Strawberry Soft. Serve you hear me. Okay, no problem, boss. I was confused after that. But instead of deterring me, his strange aggression only strengthened my curiosity. I started to think that he might have been adding some illicit, addictive substance. My suspicions grew as another couple weeks went by, and it seemed like literally everybody in the Tri-County area was habitually visiting the DQ every day. They shuffled along in line like zombies, and when they got to the register and Blake was there, not even a word would be spoken. The transaction would go through automatically, everybody already knowing what they were going to get and how much they were going to pay for it. But when I saw that my own brother had fallen victim to whatever this was, I knew I had to do something. It was even hard for me to resist the urge to be eating blizzards all the time. One day the boss had to leave for a couple hours to fetch some supplies from the supermarket. Two towns over when he was gone, I told Blake I was taking my lunch break and slipped into the back of the store. The first place I went looking was the freezer, because the boss had told me to never go inside or I might get trapped. I'd been in there before he arrived and I knew that was a bee's excuse inside. There were no buns or patties or vegetables, just cream ice and flavoring as though he knew he wouldn't be selling anything but blizzards. But there was an extra chest freezer in there that I didn't recognize. I knew that was where the secret was hidden, but when I opened it up I almost immediately act. It wasn't any illicit substance that would have been preferable. 
Stuffed inside the chest were three human bodies, mangled and broken and dismembered. There were pieces missing from each of them, hands and feet, and there were holes in their heads where their brains had been leached out. My old boss never made it to Florida, neither had his wife and neither had his kid. The new guy had double-crossed them all and taken his money back, then used their remains to cut the blizzards and make cannibals out of my entire hometown. I ran out the back door so Blake wouldn't see me. Then I got in my truck and raced home. I didn't feel safe there, though. I was so wrecked with fear that the new boss would find me and kill me and make me a strawberry blizzard like he promised. And I was worried for my family, I wrote a note and left it on the dining room table telling them to never go near the DQ and to watch their backs until the owner and son were in jail. I then called the police and left an anonymous tip. And once that was done, I packed up my things and skipped town. I had nowhere to go, but I hoped one of my friends in college would let me crash in their dorm until justice was served. But even after that's all said and done, I don't think I can ever go back there. I had a carefree life in Oakland, California. I loved hanging out with friends after work and watching live band concerts, even if it meant pushing against the crowd. But despite my love of parties and music, there was one particular interest that stood above the rest posters of him, adorned my bedroom walls filling every corner of the room. This man would be the fantasy of every Golden State Warriors fangirl, and he was none other than Stefan Curry, who could resist those gorgeous eyes, firm muscles, superb three-point shooting skills, and cunning point guard maneuvers. Seventy percent of the time I would be there to watch him live, supporting him from beginning to end. Steph was perfect, and everything he did was beautiful. I worshipped him so much that during a game between the Golden State Warriors and the Houston Rockets in 2013, I cornered a Rockets fan who called Steph an idiot. Outraged, I waited for her in the restroom and blinded her eyes with my pen. I stabbed both her eyes over and over again. Then, when it wasn't enough, I pulled on her hoop earrings and ripped them out of her pathetic earlobes. Seeing her cower and fear inside a cubicle made me feel like I had done curry justice. In 2016, when I found out the Golden State Warriors were up against the Cleveland Cavaliers for playoff season, I highlighted the entire game series on my calendar and watched all six games on June 19th. I went to watch Game 7. I felt eyes creep all over my body as men drooled at the sight of me. I couldn't blame them after all who wouldn't notice my close-fitting dress and plunging neckline. Unfortunately, this wasn't for them. This was for Curry. Game 7 was a close fight with 11 ties and 20 lead changes. However, my dear warriors were defeated by the Cavaliers. It didn't matter to me when they lost the game. And now that the game was over, I had to find a way to get close to Steph. I was on the lower level close enough to the Golden State Warriors bench, so I gave it my best shot and screamed my lungs out, saying, Steph Curry over here. His eyes wandered off across the sea of people, but nowhere near me. So when I failed to grab his attention, I hollered once again, Steph, I love you. Then another girl called out his name in the same row, mimicking the words that came out of my mouth. I wanted to yank her hair, but I couldn't, because she was three seats away from me. She wore a tube shirt and booty shorts, so when Steph waved at her, it infuriated me. You copycat witch. He's mine. I lunged towards her and grabbed her hair, starting a full-out fist fight. In that row, when the security guard noticed, he said, Hey, you two, if you girls got a problem, I have no choice but to take you outside. You got that. I was silent after that and let the trick go, but I was also furious that Steph hadn't noticed me at all. So my next step was to try and meet him up close. However, I couldn't get through a jungle of wild fans all wanting to gain access to Steph Curry. There were just too many of them. Damn it, I said, wishing that I had bought one of the more expensive tickets instead. All of them wanted to get an autograph. Then one of the girls emerged from the crowd, seeming jovial after getting what she wanted. 
She held a jersey in her hand with Curry's signature on it, but she also went the extra mile by having her right cheek signed as well. When I came closer, I recognized her as the annoying Curry fangirl. I lost it then and there. This girl didn't deserve to be happy. And so, as everyone left the arena, I stalked the woman following her silently as she rode the bus. She got off and strolled through an empty park. It's amazing how human instincts work, because I could tell she felt uneasy. She kept looking back at me, her shoulders rigid in her speed. Fast at this point, she had noticed that I was following her, so without a moment to lose, I ran and pounced, like a predator that went in for the kill. I thrashed her head in with a small rock, aiming for the temple with my pent-up anger and frustration. I didn't stop until she bled. She yelled at me and said, Get off of me. You lunatic, somebody help. Just hand me Steph's precious autograph. Give it to me now, I retorted, convinced she would cave in. All right, all right, just stop hitting me, please, she said out of shock. But it wasn't enough, so to bring me satisfaction, I took her bag, threw it to the side, and strangled her when she finally blacked out. I dragged her towards the trees and broke both her legs by kicking in her kneecaps relentlessly until she woke up from sheer pain. And when she regained consciousness, I saw fear and anxiety in her eyes. Good, good. That's exactly how I like it. I laughed deliriously. Just let me go. Please, I won't call the cops. I promise, she begged desperately. Sure, I'll let you go, but not until I get what I want, I said as I pointed at her. She looked down at the jersey she was wearing and frantically said, I was trying to tell you that you could take it, but you weren't listening to me. Are you sure about that? I teased, she replied, tossing me the jersey. Yeah, just take it and leave me alone already. Okay, thanks. It's not like you have a choice anyway. I snickered triumphantly. You know what, I hate girls like you who always get in the way of me and my beloved Stefan. She began to shed rivers of tears. Hey, stop crying. No one's gonna hear you out here. Late at night, it's just you and me. I made sure of it. I threatened her, delighted at the turn of events. Oh, and one last thing I wasn't talking about the jersey. I took out a Swiss army knife, which I always brought for self-defense, and dangled it in front of her, smiling menacingly. Wait, what are you planning to do with that? She asked in a trembling voice. Well, you have something more valuable. Then, with exuberance, I gripped the knife and pierced it through the skin on her cheek that had curry signature on it, slowly carving it out as she wailed in pain. When I was halfway finished removing the skin, I thought of something a bit more fun, so I decided to bite it off. Instead, I put the souvenirs inside my bag and took an Uber home. As I went up to my room, I framed the jersey along with the piece of skin hanging them on the wall, where I could take a side long glance at Steph's signature every so often as I fantasized about him. And I together, this story was inspired by a disturbing drawing submitted by a viewer. Here you can clearly see there's something extremely bizarre going on. The picture appears to showcase what looks like one big happy family over by the left. You can clearly see what looks to be the parents looking over their eight children or so. You can see a pet dog and cat. But over by the right is a mysterious giant black figure. More context will be explained during and at the end of the story. Here's what the story looked like. My wife and I used to have this running joke about our kids. We'd say we'd lose track of how many people were in the house if we kept having so many children. That's definitely in the category of dad jokes, but it started to get old, even for me, around the time we had our eighth kid. By then, the house was in such a constant state of disorder that it wasn't even funny anymore. It got to the point that it was a little embarrassing, maybe even a fire hazard. I guess we were lucky that it wasn't a fire that made us come to our senses about keeping the house a little more organized. But I'd argue what actually happened could have been just as bad if not worse. 
It's one of those things you would struggle to believe on TV. But when you see it happen to your own family, you aren't afforded the luxury of disbelief. I always thought a house full of kids and animals would be its own security system. I mean, with ten humans and a dog and some other creatures, you'd think there would always be at least one of them awake to sound the alarm if they noticed something. But if the business's usual state of the household is absolute chaos, nobody ever knows what's going on in a deciphered between normal and not normal, and even I can struggle sometimes with telling whether or not something one of my kids is doing is normal. Like a five-year-old boy's drawings, for instance, they always look kind of deranged and manic, just because a five-year-old only knows how to scribble with crayons. But for the most part, they're harmless. 90% of them are the same thing. Anyway, just a bunch of stick figures with names and a couple defining features here and there. Maybe a table or a chair. And with boys, sometimes there's a gun or decapitation or some crude act of violence is seen in movies and video games. All normal kid stuff, at least, I think. So every once in a while, though, something a kid of mine does makes me do a double take. Most recently, it was my youngest son, Brandon. I honestly forgot exactly how old he was when this happened, but I think he was around four or five years old. The first thing I noticed was that he wasn't sleeping right. I wake up at dawn every day to go to work, and usually the only other person who's awake in the house at that time is the dog waiting for me to let it out. However, one morning Brandon was sitting at the dining room table, lazily scribbling on a piece of paper with a bunch of crayons around it. it. Was like he'd been up all night just layering colors over the same piece of paper with a picture of the family on it. Hey, bud, what you doing there drawing? Well, I can see that. But what are you drawing? Is that mommy and I and your siblings? Maybe. I'm just a silly old man, but it looks like you drew too many people. Buddy, there's only ten of us, plus the dog and cat. And no, I can count to ten. I'm just drawing my friend, too. Oh, your friend is, uh, pretty tall there. Buddy, where'd you meet them? Here, here, in the house. When, um, I don't really remember I saw her last night. Though Dad is, she allowed in the house. A chill ran down my spine. I froze for a moment while my little boy stared me down. The way that only children can when they ask you a question you are not prepared to answer. Uh, don't worry about it. Kiddo, you probably just dreamed it up. Okay, I just didn't want to freak him out or tell the family and have them freak out. Every once in a while a kid will make something up and believe themselves. But I just had a funny feeling about this one. This was one of those cases when a kid sees something they weren't supposed to see and they weren't even aware it was wrong. I figured I'd let him at least stay calm for the moment. I knew my wife was going to be home all day, so I went ahead and went off to work, despite the goosebumps. But for the whole day, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I tried to distract myself with a task, but every time I got into something, I would get distracted with another realization. Some new pair of dots that I connected. I knew I had a lot of kids and the house was always a little messy. But recently things had gotten worse. Things that started going missing or showing up in the wrong place. Misplaced pieces of sentimental clothing. Toys that were fine one evening and broken in the morning and nobody fessing up to getting out of bed past their bedtime. Little things. My heart was racing by the time I got home and it sank when I saw my son in the exact same spot when I left eight hours ago. By then, there were several more drawings in all different colors of crayon. They were all basically the same thing, the classic family portrait, where everyone in the family was one color in one drawing, in all different colors in the others. But in every single one, there was a figure in deeply pressed black wax, with a distorted face and long, messy hair. That's when I knew I had to do something. I left right away and bought a bunch of security cameras, along with a whole new set of power tools. I spent the evening drilling holes and mounting cameras in the corners of the hallways in the living room, and even some of the bedrooms. And each one I tried to hide with some out-of-season holiday decorations. 
so they wouldn't be obvious. Tiny would be intruders, honestly. I was hoping I'd just gone crazy that I'd gotten so overworked and scatterbrained that I let the imaginations of a kindergartner get to me. But the very next morning, everything came to light. There really had been someone sneaking into the house. A woman digging through my family's laundry and trying on her clothes, rummaging through my children's toy chest, and stealing the most valuable items she could find, using my bathrooms to relieve herself, and even eating the food out of the kitchen I worked so hard to keep stock from my family. She even had the audacity to drink the milk straight out of the jug, spreading her germs to every single person in the house. I don't know how my stupid dog didn't raise hell when it saw this woman, but I guess she was some kind of dog whisperer. Or maybe my dog is just a spineless coward because all I saw my dog do was run away and hide. I don't know how, but I guess my youngest son was lying awake one night and caught a glimpse of her unsure if it was one of his sisters, his imagination or something else entirely. Of course, I called the cops immediately and had the woman arrested. That night, we made sure she faced the proper punishment of the law, but I still have nightmares about those happenings. I always kick myself and my wife against it too. We always think, maybe logically, maybe reasonably, that if we kept the house a little more tidy, we would have noticed the evidence of that woman's intrusion before it got to that point. I wanted to take my girlfriend at the seafood restaurant. I looked up on Google for our anniversary pictures of large crustaceans flooded the entire website. But what really caught my eye was the picture of a couple. The main was down on his knees, presenting a velvet ring box in front of the woman who shed tears of joy. It was the perfect marriage proposal and this time it would be my turn. I made a reservation on a Wednesday evening after confirming that my girlfriend was free because I thought booking on a Wednesday would help us avoid the huge crowd. So I picked up my girlfriend from work and we went to a restaurant called Red Lobster. When we arrived there, everything was going smoothly. We were ushered by one of the servers who cordially led us to our seats. The plan was that I would order the most enormous lobsters on the menu and as soon as we had our meal, I would kneel down and propose to her. As we skimmed through the menu, my girlfriend complimented me for choosing the perfect place. So naturally, I was filled with joy, confident she would love my big surprise right at the end. Moments later, a waitress approached our table. She had a corpulent physique. Her body smelled of rotten fish. Her hair was left in disarray and her uniform was seemingly too tight for her body built with buttons almost giving way. She looked at my girlfriend and me with disgust. Instinctively, I wanted to ask her what her problem was, but didn't really want to ruin the mood, so I let it go. Then, pouting her lips, she said, let me guess, you're here for this month's special. I didn't like her tone, but I proceeded to respond kindly, saying, oh yes, please, two giant lobsters for me and my special lady, and could you kindly add some shrimp? balls, onion rings, and grilled squid, too. Thank you, she snickered as she jotted down our order. My girlfriend must have noticed my growing infuriation, because she gently held my hand and extended an affable smile to calm me down. Then the waitress spoke again and said, Would that be all? I nodded, trying to suppress my anger. Then just when I thought she would turn away and head back to the kitchen with their arms at Kimbo, she added, It's gonna take 35 minutes for the squid shrimp, onion rings, and the lobsters. So I hope Miss Piggy over here can wait. Then she placed her dirty fingers atop my girl's shoulder, looking down at her and said, And don't munch on the linen cloth until I get back. You understand, was this some kind of elaborate prank? Because if it was, it wasn't a pretty good one. I was at my limit. And despite my girlfriend glancing at me, signaling a placid retreat, I stood up anyway and said, Who do you think you are, huh? How dare you badmouth my girlfriend like that? She snickered once more, undeniably pleased. Then said, Really? This flat blob over here is your girlfriend. How could you stoop so low? 
I clench my fists, intending to punch her. Ceased by the moment my girlfriend held both my hands, shedding tears, asking me to let it slide. I took a deep breath and firmly demanded to give our order to another waitress to save us further trouble. But instead, she simply rolled her eyes and said, Sure, whatever this night was supposed to be a romantic and convivial evening. But there was no way I would allow anyone to disrespect my girlfriend like that. Despite that, for the next 15 minutes, I was able to forget about that rude waitress and engage in a sweet conversation with my girlfriend. Then moments later, I noticed the same impertinent waitress approach our table laying down the shrimp, balls grilled squid and onion rings. In a split second, all that fury came back to me. And so I said, I thought I specifically told you to hand over the job to another waitress. Which part of my request did you not understand? Hey, shut your pie hole. We're currently understaffed. You've got the food you wanted. Didn't you now sit down like Miss Piggy over here? She replied without a tinge of remorse. This evening was a mess. There was no way I could propose to her in this situation. I've had enough already. I want to talk to your manager. Now, my voice was much louder than before, and I didn't care if we caught anyone else's attention. At this point, the server from earlier approached me and asked, I'm sorry, sir. What seems to be the problem here? The problem? You say, the problem is that my girlfriend and I just want to enjoy our dinner. But this waitress keeps coming back with a bag of insults. I flared up. The feeling was like a sudden eruption that turned into spontaneous combustion. The waitress bowed her head in embarrassment and remained silent while the other server reassured me that the enormous lobsters we ordered would arrive soon and that he would offer me free coupons for all the trouble that took place. Then the server whispered to the waitress and dragged her back to the kitchen to probably give her a good scolding. Five minutes later, the waitress came. Back and averting her gaze, she said, No low tone. I'm sorry here. Two specials upon my request. The server allowed us to take pictures of the lobsters alive with their claws. Taped up my girlfriend and I did a couple of selfie shots with the lobsters before the waitress took them back to the kitchen to have them cooked. We waited in anticipation. Then, when the waitress served the cooked lobsters, they both came in giant plates covered by gargantuan cloches. I was a tad suspicious because of the sounds emanating from the silver tableware in front of me, but decided to shrug it off. The waitress removed the clothing, said enjoy your lobster. Oh my god! Then it came at me faster than I could dodge it in an instant. The lobster jolted and clipped my nose with its claws. My girlfriend shrieked in fear as I struggled to break free after engaging in battle with a crustacean that seemed like forever. I managed to get it off with the help of a server who yanked it away from me. I screamed in pain as blood gushed out incessantly and I had to be taken to the hospital for proper treatment. My life was out of danger but I lost my nose in the process. While lying down in the hospital bed with my girlfriend by my side, we watched the news together and saw the waitress from Red Lobster get arrested. When the other staff members were interviewed, they revealed that she was a victim of domestic violence who took it out on innocent customers, even if I could still smell the scent of lobsters. I don't think I could ever step into a seafood restaurant ever again. Even though I saw it happen with my own eyes, I still can't believe that there are creeps out there who single out and target high-class ladies like me. I mean, obviously I'd heard stories about girls my age getting hurt or going missing, but all those girls were nobodies before. That all happened to them. It was what happened to them that made them something, whereas a girl like me was born somebody. I've got a reputation to uphold. You know, if people found out about this, they'd start to think I was just another brainless floozy. Another statistic. But I am no statistic. You do not get to know who I am, but you get to know what I am. I'm a daughter of affluence, and don't forget it. My daddy owns a multinational corporation, and my mom's a doctor. 
big brainiacs, both of them, and they used their smarts to make sure I'd be able to continue in their footsteps, and I'm working on that now. I'm going to school so I can become the next richest woman on the planet and make my parents proud. But a few years ago, back in like 2018, I was a little more carefree. I had a lot of freedom, and I still do mind you, but back then I was taking full advantage of my privileges. My parents basically let me do whatever I wanted with the allowance they gave me, and you can bet that it was no pittance my friend and I, for the sake of keeping a real name out of this fiasco, will call her Kayla. We both loved basketball. Well, more accurately, we love the basketball players. The Toyota Center in our home city of Houston was gearing up for the playoffs, and we'd nabbed courtside seats for the home game, which meant we'd be getting all the eyefuls of the NBA stars that we could ever want. We were getting hammered before the game even started. People call it pre-gaming. But that's where the fun really starts. At least that's what we thought. Because when we got out of the Uber, made our way through the crowd of the stadium, and sat down, we realized that our seats were more than just courtside. They were about as close to the benches of the Houston Rockets as the general populace could get. We could almost smell the cologne and sweat wafting over from their bodies. And I'm getting giddy just thinking about it now. So you can probably imagine how hard my friend and I were swooning at the time. On top of that, we basically always had some kind of intoxicating beverage in our hand at all times, trading them in for fresh ones every chance we got. We weren't even paying attention to the game. I forgot there was a ball and basket altogether. I couldn't take my eyes off the players. But by half time, my vision started to get a little blurry from all the drinks around that time. Kayla ran off somewhere. I have to use the bathroom. You let me know if anything happens while I'm gone? Oh, okay. I'm just gonna chill here for a little while. Admittedly, I'd gone a little too hard with the drinking that night, and in that moment it was catching up to me. I couldn't really see any of what was going on, and all the noise in the stadium just sounded like a bunch of bubbles underwater totally indecipherable. I had no idea if the game had even started back up yet, or if it was already completely over. Even though I did have to pee, and I probably could have been well served by some sickness in the bathroom, I decided the best thing for me to do was stay in my seat and wait for Kayla to come back, and of course, while I waited, I continued to drink. But before Kayla returned from the bathrooms, which were way up the steps of the stadium, a man came up to me, I was very faded and couldn't see him in detail, but I saw that he was very tall, with a big beard and a frohawk, which for me at the time was enough to make him look like James Harden. Hey, hey, are you James Harden? His voice was so deep and silky I shivered when he spoke. Of course I am, who else would I be? What I thought you were in the locker rooms for half time. My team is in the locker room, but I'm free to go wherever I want. And I had to come talk to the girl who's been giving me the bedroom eyes this whole time. I have to say, you're even more beautiful than I thought you'd be at a glance. Why don't we ditch this scene? Maybe come with me to my mansion. But James, what about the game? It's a lost cause, but if you'd rather stay and watch the Rockets lose, I could always find another thought. I mean, I thought you would want to leave with me, but I guess I'll find someone else. No, wait, James. Don't be that way. I'll come with you. Just, just give me a second to stand up. I'm really, before I could finish that drunken mess of a sentence. He grabbed my hand and held onto it with a firm grip as he escorted me out of the stadium. It was really hard to keep up with him. Not only did he have long legs and a stone-cold sober attitude, but he also seemed to be in a real rush to leave. For some reason, it didn't take long for me to get my first red flags, instead of going into the special garage that I thought existed for the athletes. We went into the regular garage where all the fans parked. Not only that, but he had a really lame car. It was just some cheap old Toyota. Unfortunately, the walk was doing the opposite of sobering me up. Somehow, pushing more alcohol through my system. 
I either blacked out or passed out for several minutes, because the next thing I remember is speeding down the off-ramp of a highway, then turning onto some random dirt road in the woods. Wait, what's going on? Where are we? My mansion, of course, but this is all just woods. What are you talking about? Well, I didn't lie to you. This wooded area is what I call my mansion. Suddenly, a lot of things started clearing up. A rush of panic and adrenaline sobered me up enough for me to actually start having some logical thoughts go through my head. I could see better, too. And this guy didn't look anything like James Harden. I quickly realized that the real James Harden would never abandon his team halfway through a game, let alone a game as important as the playoffs. I began to feel sick, both the hangover and the realization all dawning on me. At once I'd been duped by some rotten imposter and only God knew where he was taking me. That's when I felt my phone buzz. I pulled it out of my purse and saw that Kayla had been texting me. Where are you, girl? Where'd you go? Hello, James Harden just threw a free throw and you missed it. The game's almost over. Don't make me go home alone. That's when my instincts took over. I unbuckled my seatbelt and jumped out the door while the car was still in motion. He was going over some gravel road which bruised and cut me all over. He slammed on the brakes to try and come back and get me, but I was already rolling with the momentum and getting onto my feet, running straight into the woods where he wouldn't be able to drive after me. I had no idea where I was, but I knew it was nowhere. Good, I ran in the general direction of the highway. We just gotten off of traipsing through a number of weakly blazed trails. I wasn't thinking about it at first, but then I was forced to realize what had made these trails. Every once in a while I saw a body, a dead body of another young girl that used to be pretty. Before death and decay got to her, some of them were putrid and hollowed out, like they'd been there for weeks. But others still were shockingly fresh, as if they'd been killed just a few days ago. This man had to be a serial killer. God knows I didn't stop to inspect them. I couldn't hear the murderous imposter chasing after me. It took what felt like hours before I got back to the highway. From there, I got to a different road and called up another Uber and made my way back to Kayla's house. She was the only one I ever told about this ordeal until now. But after all that aftermath, I still attend NBA games. Till this day, I just make sure my cup is non-alcoholic, as I don't want to encounter another hardened imposter again. Hey LeBron, I'm your biggest groupie. I mean, fan fan, I hope you can hear my cheers. I'm a masseuse at a therapeutic massage parlor, one that's known for being a respite for tired and weary workers who require accommodations at later times of the night. Then most parlors stay open. We're officially open until 10 o'clock, but in many cases the girls and I tend to stay at work as late as midnight, working on quote-unquote overtime for our regular clients. Since we're open so late, there have always been rumors that we operate a little sleazier after hours, offering services that are outside the realm of massage therapy. But I don't participate in any of that. I go to work to use the skills I learn in school to make a living. My body, though I'm sure it can make money, if I desire to use it, that way is my sanctuary that said, I mind my own business. As far as the other girls are concerned, they're allowed to do what they want. I'm not their boss, and I don't judge. It's just not something I would do, though. I do understand feeling the need for a little extra cash on top of the regular paychecks. I have my own side hustle as well. I operate a sort of freelance massage business out of my home for the really, really late night clients. Still, I don't offer any sleazy services, especially in my own home. I'm just a night owl and I'm usually up until sunrise most nights. Anyway, so I don't mind working until two or three in the morning as long as the clients pay the convenience fee. My home massages aren't the most popular thing. However, as I don't venture to tell many people about it, I only let very specific kinds of people into my home, 
usually the more unorthodox people who may not feel as comfortable in the public parlor. I'll explain what I mean. One day I arrived at work around the same time as a co-worker of mine. We entered the lobby together and scanned the room for the potential clients we might end up getting. For the most part, the crowd was pretty typical, but there was one man who stood out. He was impossible not to see, because he looked to be taking up three whole seats in the waiting room. The grossest thing about those sorts of people, in my opinion, is the clothes they wear. They must struggle to find clothes that fit them. And for that matter, the act of doing laundry must be a daunting task, because it always looks like they've been wearing the same raggedy old stain-ridden shirts and crusty baggy sweatpants with overstretched waistbands. I shudder when we made eye contact, and he gave me that snaggletooth smile. My co-worker and I both tried to ignore the man we walked through the lobby to the front desk where the receptionist was waiting to give us our schedules for the evening. Neither of us wanted to get that obese man's appointment, but of course his fate would have it. I received it. I sighed and tried to hide my intense feelings of disgust. I reveled in the appointments I had before, where I got to work on regular, semi-attractive, or at least not revolting people, but my time with him came sooner than I wanted. Appointment for Johnson. That's me. I watched him squirm and pry himself out of the seats. He was wedged in it. Took him a good minute when he finally made it to his feet and hobbled over to me. I suppressed my urge to gag and tried to pretend that he was just any normal client. Go on in and get comfortable undress if you'd like, and there's towels in there for you. I'll be in after a few minutes so you can get settled on the table before you begin. You have such a hospitable and welcoming attitude, ma'am. Just the sound of your voice is already relaxing me, but I bet your hands will relax me even more. That's why they pay me the big bucks, Mr. Johnson. I waited a few agonizing minutes, then entered the massage room. I did not engage in conversation. I wanted this whole thing to go by in silence, and for the first minute or so it seemed like that would be the case. He didn't say anything as I hold up my arms and hands, but as soon as I put my hands on him, he started moaning, and it wasn't the quiet, muffled moaning you might expect from someone laying face down. No, it sounded like the dramatic, theatrical, wall-piercing moans of a man in the middle of... Well, you know, sir, please try to be respectful, I'm sorry, baby, but it just feels so good. Well, at the very least, keep it down so the other clients can't hear you. There could be kids out there. You're right, you're right. This will stay between you and me. Thank you. Most of the massage wasn't so bad. He didn't talk the entire time, but every few minutes he'd say some unsavory, suggestive things. I could use a lot more of your angelic touch, now and later. Maybe we can be friends outside this place as well. Nope. I just had to keep shutting him down. All of his advances were verbal in origin, so it was easy to keep my cool. His body was a vile, swampy mess of mold and sores on an ocean of fat. But I can massage anybody. I had a strong enough stomach to work on him. At least within the confines of my job. I just don't know how people can live like that. It honestly just makes me sad. I was very excited to be over with. Looks like that's all the time we have. Mr. Johnson, uh, what a shame over. So soon you think you can finish me off with a little something, something. Give me a break. But it just ain't gonna happen. I'm a masseuse. I'll massage you for payment. Nothing else. Well, I really could use some more massaging. There's... A lot of me to work on. Hmm. You know what, John, I also do massages at my house. I'd be happy to do another session with you in about two hours, as long as you understand that it's just a massage. All right, that sounds divine, but wait. Don't they forget to tip you? I set up my massage table in the living room at about 1.30. He rang the doorbell. Welcome in. I'd like to begin as soon as possible. So let me just get a couple of things out of the way. I 
need you to sign this agreement form for record-keeping purposes. I just do this to make sure I don't get scammed. You understand? Great, now here's the menu. Look it over carefully and tell me what you'd like. John then scans the menu of specials, which included stuff like 30-minute or one-hour specials. The Japanese special. But of course, John, like many past clients, would request the happy ending special, baby. That's what I want. Very well. Get comfortable. And you'll need these, you know, for the happy ending. I left him alone in the room, knowing that he was on the other side of the door, stripping down to nothing but an XL tower on his waist, and most importantly, blindfolds over his eyes. Sure enough, when I came back in, he was already laid on the table face up. This time, I could see plainly through the towel that he thought he knew where this was going. He didn't have the slightest clue my razor-sharp axe went through his flabby question into his precious arteries and trachea, and to this day I'm still baffled that people ask for my happy ending special, despite not even reading what it entailed. This following story was inspired by a Baton Rouge male who worked at a Dairy Queen. I just want to give you a disclaimer that what you're about to witness might make you queasy the next time you order at a fast food restaurant. I personally find this story rather disgusting and scary. Here's what it looked like. I've been in and out of jail in the past, but hey, I never killed anybody. All right, I was arrested on account of theft and illegal substance imports, and nothing more now. That I was free again, I had found Serenity, a Dairy Queen, where my manager and colleagues were all nice to me. I felt that I could handle any situation, no matter how stressful it was, with only one exception. No police officers, I'd survived my first two weeks on the job, without any commotion. But one day it all went downhill, when my worst nightmare entered through those heavenly doors. A stout man in a black, long-sleeve uniform with a peak cap and a shiny badge. I knew it was too good to be true, because no matter how much I wanted Dairy Queen to be free of these vermin, police officers couldn't resist the mouth-watering treats Dairy Queen had to offer. I attempted to ask my colleagues to handle the customer, telling them that I was sufficiently under the weather. However, it was one of those busy days where everybody had something to do and to make matters worse. We were understaffed, so I had no choice but to handle the task delegated to me. Looking down at the counter, I felt really uncomfortable standing in front of the officer. I thought that perhaps there was a way for me to still get his order without making direct eye contact. But then, moments later, the cop called my name with a familiar tone that instantly sent chills down my spine. Well, 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 look who we have here. It's my old buddy, Mr. Johnson. So how's life out of prison? He asked aloud with a smug look on his face. I didn't appreciate what he was doing, letting my colleagues and other customers know about my past, since it might scare them off or give Dairy Queen a bad image. With my mama's reminders running through my head, I took a deep breath, urging myself to remain calm. It's been swell, officer, I replied monotonously. Then, in a split second, memories of a past that I kept neatly tucked in the archives of my brain rushed back to the surface. I had flashbacks of Officer Ralph forcing me into a corner so that he could beat me up with his truncheon whenever he felt like it. One time, he and another officer took me to the restroom where I nearly drowned after they dipped my head into a drum of water. But I had to put all those thoughts back where they belonged in the past. After all, I didn't want to make a scene. Then, moments later, the irksome cop scanned my body from head to waist and said, from what I recall, this type of job doesn't suit you at all. It was apparent that he was trying to provoke me, but all I said was, may I take your order, sir? He shook his head with a smirk and replied, Sure, I'd like one burger, 50 Oreo blizzard cakes, and 80 chocolate blizzards. All right, that would be $2,355, sir, I replied, my body stiff from all the tension. Well, maybe you can pay for me, Mr. Johnson, he said, placing his filthy hand on my shoulder. You know, for old times' sake, I wanted to justify my rights.
and the immorality of his ways, but he sensed that I wanted to retaliate. Officer Ralph tightened his grip, pulled me close to him and whispered in my ear, saying, Know your place, boy. I could always visit the manager's office and tell him all the terrible things you did that brought you to jail. I guess you never told him about it. Right, clenching my fist to control my anger, I replied. If that's all, I'll take your orders to the kitchen staff and get them ready. That's more like it, Officer Ralph said as he chortled delightfully. Going back to the kitchen, I handed over the orders of ice cream cakes to my colleagues. Then, while one of them was on break, I took his place at the hamburger making station and began to cook, recalling all the horrible things he did to me in prison. I knew of a way that could mitigate my growing apprehension. I knew that there were eyes on us in the kitchen with multiple cameras at every corner, so I had to be tremendously cautious while the patty was being grilled. I took the bun positioning myself off camera and spat on it, leaving behind a clear greenish blob of saliva. It gave me such relief that I chuckled at the thought of him eating that burger. Then I went back to the grilling station, took the patty and placed it neatly inside the bun before wrapping it, when it was finally time to give this customer his food. He came to the counter, took one Oreo blizzard cake, and started mashing it with his bare hand, eating the sponge and licking off the ice cream from his fingers, like a pig displaying a pompous attitude. It feels so good having this much food for free. Mr. Johnson, I think I'm gonna drop by this place more often. He teased me like the bullying that he was. You're gonna regret this, I said in a low tone. Did you just threaten an officer? Mr. Johnson, he said his posture straight and his tone condescending. It was nothing, forget about it. I recoiled, looking down in my hands on the counter. Then, as he returned to his seat with his burger and cakes, I watched him from my peripheral vision as he took a small bite out of the burger. As soon as I turned my back, I heard him scream, Oh, what the hell is that? What the hell did you put in my burger? He marched back to the counter, calling out my name, saying, Mr. Johnson, is this your saliva on my burger bun? I did, not a single word, but I looked at him menacingly, and he immediately caught on. So he stepped back and spoke to someone on his radio, then asked me to come quietly to his car. All right, Mr. Johnson, you're under arrest for your poor conduct and despicable act. So please put your hands behind your back and step out of the counter, Officer Ralph demanded. Hey, I know my rights. Okay, since you have no proof that my saliva is on your burger bun. I'm staying right here, I replied, confident that I could get away with it. However, two other officers came in and forced me into submission, as I resisted as long as I could. When we arrived at the police station, they reviewed the surveillance footage and called me spitting saliva on the bun. Just like that, I was behind bars once again, from mingling harmful substances and resisting a cop. Hey, I'm just glad I wasn't charged with attempted murder, and that officer isn't dead. You see, I later admitted to the law enforcement that I had several diseases, which would have made that night his last time a Dairy Queen. The next story was inspired by this disturbing drawing that had surfaced the internet for quite some time. It of course involves a female named Valerie, who discovers a very unsettling drawing upon some kid's nightstand. She was looking after. You won't believe what went down that night, as Valerie was literally trapped in a house of horrors. Here's what it looked like. I'm currently in college and live on the res. When I come home for the summer break, I take on odd jobs from house-sitting to babysitting just to bring in some extra cash to save up for the fall semester. I've been babysitting every summer since I was 15. So the families in my hometown were quite familiar with me. I run an ad on Craigslist for my services, so I was accustomed to getting calls from all sorts of area codes. Unfortunately, business was running a little slower than usual, but through word of mouth I was recommended to babysit for this new family that had moved into town. 
they had a son named Lucas, who was around the age of seven and needed to be looked after every Friday. They were posh and elegant folks that lived in a large, upscale house. The father was some successful lawyer, and the mother was some young broad that probably reaped all the rewards from that guy over the next couple of Fridays. I had gone to babysit Lucas at their home. The job was quite laid back. The kid was well-mannered and easy to watch. He was punctual when it came to his bedtime, and after reading a couple of bedtime stories of his choice, he was out cold. The parents came home, paid me, and off to my house. I went. Considering the family paid me an incalculable amount for just a few hours on a Friday night, I usually took any offer they threw in my direction. But one day the mom called me and pitched an unexpected offer that went against my policy. Hello, Valerie. It's Mrs. Holloway. I've got another job for you. Mr. Holloway and I will pay you a flat rate of two hundred. But we need you to stay the weekend with Lucas. Oh no, I'm sorry, Mrs. Holloway. I don't do overnights. Are you sure? What if we offered a flat rate of four hundred? I was hesitant in taking the offer, but the money she was offering was inconceivable. I'd be an idiot to pass up that opportunity. I agreed to bend my rules for them, as Lucas was easy to take care of. The weekend came, and I packed a suitcase to get me through two days. Mrs. Holloway gave me a walkthrough on how to use the appliances in the kitchen for when I cook food for Lucas. She was even going to show me the guest room. Where I was going to settle in, the couple eventually left, and it was just myself and Lucas. I asked him what he wanted to do, and he insisted on spending time in his bedroom drawing. I remember leaving his door open while I went to the guest room across from his and began watching TV. I checked in on Lucas every half hour to an hour or so, and found it rather strange that the kid wanted to spend all his time drawing. Considering all the video game consoles he had in the living room, after a few minutes of prepping our respective plates, I went up to Lucas's room and noticed he was still honed in on his drawings. I could hear him utter some gibberish while simultaneously drawing. As I knocked on his door and said, "Lucas, dinner's ready," and it goes, hearing this, this goes here. I said, "Dinner is ready. Bring it up here. Can't you see I'm busy?" Couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was visibly taken aback and knew he could see it too. Due to the expression on my face, he then put his markers down and came down to the dining area where I then served dinner. We both sat and ate in silence. I couldn't help but feel the awkward tension in the air, as I could sense he was itching to head back to his room and draw more. As I tried to spark up some conversation, Lucas didn't say a word. He didn't even acknowledge my existence as he kept his eaves glued to his plate. I couldn't help but feel baffled. It was almost if I was talking to another kid from the complete 180. He pulled since our first interaction. I began to question if I had done something wrong, but the little brat just kept ignoring me. Lucas then excused himself and headed back to his room. To be honest, I didn't know how to feel or act. So I just kept my mouth shut and played the waiting game till the parents arrived. As I cleaned up after the two of us, I headed upstairs and could see Lucas back at it again, with his drawings through the narrow opening of his door. During the rest of my stay there, it had become a daily thing, maybe an hourly thing, or even an every minute kind of thing, where Lucas would completely indulge himself in his drawings every time I passed by his room. Every Time I asked him to come down and eat, he would just shout stuff like "I'm busy, leave," and pointed out the door like I was some dog or something. I then came to the realization that the kid I once thought was charming and funny was anything but an obsessed narcissist who was infatuated with his artistic craft and nothing else. I didn't bother to alert his parents and opted to just ride out the rest of the gig till his parents arrived back. As I knew this would be the last time I would ever babysit this kid again on the last night, just an hour shy before the parents arrived back, I made it my duty to check out his drawings before leaving the house. I couldn't 
couldn't help but feel curious as to what the hell he was drawing that would not make him want to leave his room. I remember curling up in my bed while watching some TV when I heard the little twerp head downstairs. That was my cue to head to his bedroom, so I quickly turned off the TV and darted down the hallway. I could feel my heart racing out of my chest. Despite my adversary only being seven years old, I wasn't down to face the noise and certainly wasn't down to deal with an inevitable temper tantrum. If I was to get caught red-handed in his room, I could recall seeing the sketch pad sitting on his desk. I picked it up and literally had to bite my tongue as I felt the sudden urge to scream. There lied a picture of a stick figure with its head chopped off. There was an axe hovered over the head with a message above it saying, Dear Valerie, get out of my life. I froze in disbelief, trembling as I read the message over and over again. I mean, literally. I read the message over and over again as the rest of the sketch pad had the same exact drawing with the same message on it. I carefully ripped off one of the pages and slid it inside my back pocket as I backed. Belongings, but was able to grab my sneakers when heading out. Luckily, I had my phone on me and ended up calling an Uber home while I was on my way back. I ended up calling Lucas's parents, but didn't get a response. I decided to leave a few text messages regarding the situation. When I got to my house, I curled up into my bed and couldn't help but stare at Lucas's disturbing drawing. About a minute later, I got a text message from the mom saying, Where the hell are you and why did you leave my son home alone? He was only joking around. I didn't bother to respond back, I just put my phone on. Do not disturb and tried sleeping the night off. When I woke up the next morning, I checked my phone and could see hundreds of missed calls and texts saying stuff like, Can you please call me back? We need to talk. Val, can you please come back to pick up your money? I also wanted you to babysit Lucas for one more weekend. If that's okay, I left her on red and never babysat for her or anyone. Ever again, we had plenty of customers during the day, and they were all regulars. I own a massage parlor, which has been around for about five years now, and one of my best employees was Lizzie. She had long, brown, curly hair, wearing a floral dress when she first came to apply as a massage therapist. She had prior experience in this line of work, which was definitely a plus. But apart from her skill set, her cheerful and vibrant personality instantly convinced me to hire her one night. An hour before closing time, I facilitated one of our new staff at the cashier counter. When an odd-looking customer with a large duffel bag came in, he had scruffy hair like he hadn't showered in days. His eyes were red, probably due to over-fatigue, and his shirt, for some reason, was inside out. I didn't want to be judgmental, and so I asked, How can we help you, sir? Would you like to try one of our new services? He didn't answer. In fact, he seemed to be surveying the area, but for reasons I couldn't fathom. Then, out of the blue, Lizzie approached me from behind and asked, Miss Rachel, I think we're out of sacred earth lotion. Could I drop by Walmart to buy some? As Lizzie and I were talking, I could see from my peripheral vision that the man's eyes were all on Lizzie, scanning her from head to toe, drawing a meniscus grin as he drooled. I could tell that Lizzie was feeling a bit anxious, and I couldn't blame her. The man was disgusting. I had a bad feeling about him, but I couldn't drive him away based on a mere hunch. We still had sacred earth lotion in the storage room. Therefore, I asked Lizzie to search for a specific box on the top shelf, which she might have missed earlier as soon as she left. The man approached me and asked, Oh, I've never seen her before. Is she new here? Well, it's the same. I can say for you, sir, I haven't seen you around these parts. I retorted, infuriated by his lack of hygiene and how he pretended to be an old customer. You got me. He wanted to make it look like he was messing around, but I wasn't pleased. 
there was just something about him that rubbed me the wrong way. Then he proceeded to say that pretty girl you were talking to, I want her to give me a massage. He brought out some cash from his pocket and handed it to the cashier, who looked at me with reluctance. I gave a curt nod, accepting the customer's payment. I called Lizzie, who had just returned after bringing out the last bottle of sacred earth lotion, since the new cashier was a working student. I allowed her to end her shift early. The other staff went out to buy food, so by now it was just me, Lizzie and the strange man. I stayed at the front desk while Lizzie was in a room providing services to the customer. Moments later, I heard a loud banging sound on the door of one of the rooms. I jolted from my seat, thinking about Lizzie. By the time I reached the massage door, the banging had stopped. I tried to open the door, but the door was locked from the inside. I had several keys in my pocket as I frantically searched for the right key. I heard Lizzie's muffled voice through the door, screaming. As soon as I unlocked the door, I entered a room that made me nauseous. There was a pool of blood on the floor, and the man was standing two meters away from me, holding a pistol in his right hand aimed directly at my head. His eyes were round and furious, while his entire body trembled in anger when I saw Lizzie. She was still conscious, however, she was losing. Her legs were cut off from the calf down to her toes, including her hands while looking at the deranged man. His left hand held a machete drenched in blood. Lizzie attempted to speak, despite the pain, and said, I'm sorry. Please just let us go. Don't do this. Please, the man gripped his machete, gave a stern, sidelong glance, and replied, Sorry, I wanted to spend more time with you, but you called me a freak. How dare you? Do you know what I do to people who don't give me what I want? I take it back. It won't happen again. I swear, Lizzie begged. Suddenly, the man bristly walked towards poor Lizzie. Lizzie screamed out my name. Then, in a blink of an eye, her head was chopped off, rolling on the floor until it came to a halt. Silence filled the room for a brief moment, and her once vibrant eyes were now empty. My heart was pounding fast. I wanted to holler out loud, but with Lizzie gone, the only remaining target was me. To talk about this, maybe I can help you, I said, raising my hands in the air, letting him know that I meant him no harm. His eyes were glaring at me like he was blaming me for what had happened. All I wanted was for her to come with me, but she said, no, it's always. No, I'm sick and tired of this. I understand, but my voice trembled as I pretended to console him. Then, as he took Lizzie's head, he said with tears and apathy in his eyes, I decided to cut her entire body piece by piece, because that way I could take her home without complaints. You know, it was perfect until you came in and ruined everything without a moment to lose. I ran out of the room as he fired the pistol twice. Then I heard him growl and say, What the hell is wrong with this gun? He dropped the gun and went after me. I blocked his path with chairs, but despite the obstruction, his rage was enough to push the chairs aside until he caught up to me and yanked my hair. I dropped to the ground. Then he pulled me by my wrist and with his machete, he sliced off my hand. I bellowed in pain as blood poured out as he aimed for my head. I kicked him on the leg where he lost his balance, dropping the machete. Then I lunged forward and got a hold of it stood up, used every ounce of my strength in my body, and chopped his head off. For a moment I stared the lifeless body in front of me, unable to think straight. Then I made that 911 call officers and emergency care assistants arrived at the scene. But when authorities tried to ask me questions, I was too terrified to say anything. Months after the incident, I still had nightmares of that gruesome evening for this story. It's certainly not doorbell footage, but something even more chilling. Something that's gone beyond those realms. As you're now looking at breaking and entering here, you can see the perpetrator clearly lurking within this individual's household while they're asleep. The next story was inspired by this very chilling case. My mom's a lot, like a lot of moms, I think, because she's always had the habit of giving me advice that didn't really seem important. At the time, 
though she always tried to boil down life lessons into a saying, but she should have known that I was never going to learn that way. Girl, you better be careful. Hanging around all those boys, they're going stupid with puberty. Whatever, Mama, I can handle myself. You ain't listening to me now, but you'll know what I'm talking about. Soon enough, all boys your age want the same thing, and it ain't your personality. Mom, come on, they're just my friends. She'd say stuff like that so much that I just started tuning her out. It was my second year of high school, and all I wanted to do was live my life. I didn't have time to be sheltered, and it wasn't like I was an idiot. I knew who was good and who was bad for me, as far as I was concerned, even though I wouldn't admit it. I always knew she was right about one thing. stuff at such a young age. What stuff are you talking about? Don't play dumb with me. You know, you best be careful who you're getting that stuff from. Those boys are the worst of all. You can't ever be alone with them. You hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I got so tired of her interrogating me every time I got home. Then I started to sneak out after she went to sleep. I figured if she didn't know that I'd ever left, she wouldn't know any better about what I was getting up to. I should have known she would find out. Mom's fine about everything. She caught me sneaking back in through my window one night, and she flipped out. She grounded me, gave me a stupid curfew, and didn't let me go anywhere, and she took my phone away. The only thing I could use to talk to my friends was my school laptop, which she knew she couldn't take away, but she did not stop there. She bought that camera that goes on your doorbell, and she got extra cameras to put in the house to make matters worse. She didn't even let me sleep in my room. She made me sleep on the couch. All that combined made it impossible to go anywhere. Even if I wanted to sneak out, there was no way I could get away with it. And because I couldn't hang out with my friends anymore, they started to turn on me. They understood for a couple of days that I was grounded by my helicopter mom. But it didn't last after a week or so. They just started talking down to me, saying stuff like, I was a mama's girl prude in a flake for not hanging out. And it wasn't just my friends, it seemed like it was everybody I knew, boys included. And even some of the boys that I've curved were coming back into my DMs just to diss me that made me mad as all get out. But the worst part of it was that it made me realize my mom was right about who I was hanging out with. Sure, they were cool when we were hanging out together, but as soon as my back was turned, they started talking smack. And then when I tried to talk to them, they were all full of vinegar, like I was totally replaceable to them, and they didn't want to even hang out with me anymore. That, or they wanted something from me, and they were mad because they didn't have a chance to get it anymore. But it didn't end there. Those cameras my mom put up in the house never caught me sneaking out. I was going to wait for her to chill out before I tried anything, but what ended up happening made it so that my mom would never be chill again. I was sleeping on the couch kinda half asleep because it wasn't too comfortable and I was all mad about my friends. 
Every once in a while I'd open my eyes, and the only thing I could see in the darkness of the living room was the red light on the camera that was watching me. It made me so uncomfortable knowing that at any moment I could be getting watched by my mom on the other end of that camera. As it turns out, that was the least of my worries. One of those times I woke up, I looked straight up and saw a creepy looking figure standing over me. He was slouched inside of a hood, staring right at me for a moment that felt like a lifetime. My blood went cold and my body froze. I didn't know what he was going to do. I guess you ain't got money no more, but we can work out a deal for a quarter. Mom, there's somebody in the house called the cops. Mama, the creep bolted off as soon as I hollered. My mama was up in a flash, running into the room with a big old flashlight. I'm sure she would have loved to beat over the kid's head. Boy, she fawned over me, something fierce. I really was scared from the shock when I woke up. But after a minute or two, I wasn't shaken. I continued to act scared, though just because I figured that's what my mom expected. She had the police come out and they asked me all their questions. Then the news heard about it and came through with all of their questions. But honestly, by then, I didn't care. I told them all the same thing, that I didn't recognize him, but I think he went to my school. The truth is, is that I know exactly who he is, but I didn't tell that to anyone. That would just be more trouble for me than it's worth. I made sure to give that creep a piece of my mind. In my own way, my mama taught me how to do that. Just fine, to be totally clear. My mom ended up being right about a lot of things. Her and I got a lot closer over this experience, but not much has changed. I listen to her advice a lot more, but I sure ain't gonna let some lanky deadbeat scare me out of living my life the way I want to. Home security cameras here captured video of a stranger standing directly over a sleeping teenager in Kansas. Take a look. Anya Robinson says when she opened up her eyes, she felt like she was in a scene from a movie. The Wichita Police Department responded quickly, but the intruder had already left the home. Hi, sir, would you like to buy some chocolate? Um, how much? How much you got? This story was inspired by a 42-year-old woman who entered a Red Lobster restaurant on a Saturday night. She was allegedly belligerent, but it was what she did at the Red Lobster that shocked the staff and fellow customers. As a disclaimer, the animation does exaggerate the incident, but overall you'll get the gist of what went down that night. Here's what it looked like when you trained to become a waiter at a semi-fancy restaurant, like Red Lobster. You actually have to train as a host for several months before they let you become a server. I didn't know this until I'd already been hired on as a server and then got stuck in a totally different job. Basically, what this means is your bosses have an excuse to withhold your share of the tips while you get paid less than minimum wage to stand in front of the entrance and greet every single customer that comes through the door. Sounds like an easy job as long as you're not socially inept, and it is easy most days when it's not busy. Much of the time in a day is spent chilling in silence with the lobsters in the tank. By the front door, I always found it weird how they keep them on display. If you didn't know, those lobsters really are the same lobsters that you would eat at Red Lobster. If you were to order a lobster, every once in a while someone from the kitchen would come by and pluck one out then abducted back to the kitchen to be boiled alive and served on a platter. It sounds silly, but when I was working as a host at Red Lobster, it was hard not to get attached to the little guys. Most of the people that come through the door treat the host like a robot, and the servers all basically acted like I didn't exist unless they needed something from me. The lobsters in the tank, though we had an understanding, I was mindlessly waiting for the clock to hit quitting time so I could be freed from my prison of employment, and they were waiting for their claws clammed shut to be put out of their bland, overcrowded misery. Obviously, the lobsters and I were in very different situations, and I guess I sounded crazy, talking this much about shellfish. But all this imaginary friendship with the lobsters was born out of a psychological necessity. 
the monotony of being a host at a restaurant can be soul-crushing, especially when combined with the fact that you're forced to be nice and chatty with people who obviously don't care about you at all. It can get disheartening at times, being around so many people for so many hours, yet feeling like you haven't been acknowledged as a living thing a single time the whole day. But every once in a while, something so amazing happens that it makes every previous mundane hour totally worth it. I think about this day a lot. It was a pretty average Saturday in November, getting later into the evening late enough for a good portion of the customers coming through to have already become intoxicated by the drinks they had at whatever work, party, backyard, barbecue, or tailgate they had just left. Red Lobster is a popular spot for the drunk and middle-aged. It's like getting drunk food at Taco Bell for college students. But for older folks, it was getting to be very busy, and I had to watch the tank that was full of lobsters at the start of the afternoon slowly get whittled down until only a handful were left. That's when she walked in. Walked in isn't even the right term. She stumbled in so unhinged and flat-footed that the whole restaurant turned to look at the commotion she made just by coming through the door. She pushed several people out of the way and clambered up to the hosting stand, almost knocking it over with her momentum reeking of strong spirits in a midlife crisis. I need a table. There's going to be about a 30 to 45 minute wait before any tables are available. Will that be all right? No, that won't be all right. I said I need a table. What's wrong with you? I'm sorry, ma'am, but there are several parties waiting ahead of you. You will get a table if you wait a gesture to the crowd of people waiting just inside the front door. The crowd of people she just barreled through. A few seconds ago, she turned back to look at what I was pointing to, then acted like she hadn't even noticed them until this moment. What? Well, screw those people, I'm the biggest fan of lobster in this, in this whole freaking city. At this point, the woman had started to use obscenities quite liberally, and more than loud enough to be heard over the background noise of the restaurant. The customers around us began looking on with disdain, and that's when the situation caught my manager's attention. Ma'am, if you can't calm down and wait like everyone else, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. Why don't you suck on my spit, mister? I'm holier than thou all I wanted was a damn lobster. But you and all your point Dexter little bus boys keep getting in my way. All right, that's enough, I'm calling. The police to have you removed, you disrespectful wench. There was a gasp of silence, a moment of utter shock. I knew this situation had escalated rather quickly, but to hear my manager say something like that to a customer even under his breath, I just never expected it from him. Maybe he'd been having a bad day, or maybe he and this woman had a history I didn't know about, but it didn't matter. Everyone in the restaurant heard it, and he would never live it down. And unfortunately, though, she was so lost in the sauce that she could barely walk, the woman was able to pick up on this breach, and it empowered her even further. Disrespectful. You think I'm disrespectful? Oh, no, no, no. What's disrespectful is making a woman go hungry, denying her the right to eat when the food is right there. It's right there. You know what? I don't even need all this. I don't need a table or someone to kiss my ass. All I need is one of you. Ma'am, please don't butt. It was too late. There was no stopping her as she vaulted over the edge of the tank and crashed down into the water, splashing everyone within a ten-foot radius. The lobsters scurried away from her, but they couldn't get far. Everyone in the restaurant could do nothing but look on in stunned bewilderment at the woman in the lobster tank. Maybe getting flushed with cold, salty water sobered her up a bit because she was only there for a moment. She grabbed around until she caught hold of a lobster. Then she threw it out of the tank. Next, 
She rather hilariously attempted to climb out a few times, slipping back in on a number of attempts, before finally managing to get her old, flabby body over the edge of the tank, then she fell down to the floor like a sack of bricks. She scurried up to her feet, soaking wet and dripping water everywhere, looking around with crazed eyes and breathless, gritted teeth while she'd been struggling to climb out. I'd found myself walking over to the lobster that had fallen to the floor, about to pick it up. No, he's mine! The woman screamed in my face and snatched up the lobster, before I could lay my hands on it with the lobster in hand. She looked around one more time at the very unusual scene she had created, then bolted out the door. A few days later, I heard that the police had tracked her down and arrested her, slapping her with some kind of indecent public intoxication charge. My manager seemed to be happy about it, but none of us really liked him after the way he handled the situation. To begin with, what struck me, though, was that the woman was never charged with theft, even though that lobster was worth a chunk of change. I never even heard if the lobster was ever recovered if she ever got home with it. The likelihood is that she tried to cook it and eat it, probably horribly mangling it in the ugly process of her drunken preparation. But I like to think that she had a change of heart on the way home, and instead relieved him of his rubber band restraints and set him free into a channel. Somewhere, I just want to believe that at least one of those lobsters that came through the restaurant got afforded another chance at life. Even if the circumstances were unusual, a 42-year-old woman was arrested Saturday after stealing a live lobster. The Patellas County Sheriff's Office says the manager of the St. Petersburg Red Lobster asked Kimberly Gable to leave because she was bothering other customers. He told deputies that Gable shouted obscenities as she headed for the door, grabbed a live lobster from the tank near the entrance, and took off deputies found Gable nearby. But she no longer had the lobster. She is charged with disorderly intoxication and theft. They just understand me. People always want all that huggy, kissy crap. I love sweets. So when I got a part-time job at Dairy Queen, I felt like I was one lucky girl as one of the crew members. I was in charge of food production and sanitation. However, every now and then I would also take on the role of cashier. I had no qualms about my colleagues. We all got along pretty well while I was still learning the ropes. They were there to entertain my queries and lend a hand whenever I was uncertain about what I was doing. There were usually eight of us, and we were a good team. However, just when I thought it was a piece of heaven on earth, every time I left for work, I would arrive at Dairy Queen, greeting a corpulent lady whose makeup was always too thick, like Ursula from the classic Disney film The Little Mermaid. The hairnet kept her curls in place, and her uniform was neatly pressed, emphasizing her strict discipline towards sanitation and order. This was our manager, and according to the employee, she was often called Madame. One day, the manager could no longer contain her anger that she demanded a skinny female crew member, who was often sick and late, to work to do a hundred sit-ups in the kitchen area. Every time she attempted to take a break, the manager would scowl and kick her somewhere near the ribcage. I was so... stunned that I forgot to look 88. Octillion 8888, trillion 8888, billion 8888, million 8888,088 away. When I should have, so when the manager caught me looking at her, she glared at me with gritted teeth and said, What the hell are you looking at? Huh. My body trembled as I went back to work. I was in front of the ice cream station when I was making the blizzards. When I heard the kicking stopped, I was sweating profusely now as I saw this terrifying person approaching me from my peripheral vision. Then, not a moment too soon, she grabbed my hair intending to push my head towards the blizzard mixer, so I instinctively fought against her sinister force, with my hands gripping the mounted wall cabinets hanging above the commercial mixer. It seems you have so much spare time in your hands that you can't help but mind other people's business, she 
whispered menacingly into my ears. I, I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't mean to. You see, Miss Davis, I have a reputation to uphold. What would happen to me if you screwed up all the ice cream? Huh, she said as she pushed my head a bit further right onto the machine. My hand pressing against the dispense button and ice cream pouring out everywhere from the floor to the inside of my shoes, concerned that the floor would be a safety hazard. I desperately said, Madam, please stop. Then just when my colleague was about to tap her on the shoulder, she released her grip, allowing me to step back for a moment. Then she yanked me by the collar and whispered, If you tell your family about this, it's not only your job that's at stake here. I have other ways to mess up. That pretty little face of yours. Get back to work, you useless pile of trash, she exclaimed, glowering at all the employees before returning to the office and slamming the door behind her. I was consoled by all my co-workers, and one of them, who was also a teenager like me, approached me and said, After what I've seen, I think we better resign. There are better work environments out there. Anyway, I'd even go as far as to report her. I agreed with her, of course, after all, the manager was nuts. So I decided to work until the end of this week. After acquiring the last of my hard-earned salary, all I had to do during this time was avoid getting on the manager's bad side. The following day, I was dipping some french fries and oil when the manager approached me with a tyrannical look. She said, What do you think you're doing? You're supposed to be on break. Go on, leave your post still shaken from our last conversation. I politely declined her command, saying thanks for your concern, but I already had my break and I need to complete my remaining tasks before my shift ends. She continued to glare at me, which I thought was perplexing, since I precluded the use of any offensive words or expressions. Then she said, insubordination, are you saying that I'm wrong? That was entirely irrelevant to what I said. I was infuriated and I wanted to give her a piece of my mind. But upon recalling her threat, I recoiled and decided not to speak, in case responding to her in any way gave her the wrong impression. I just asked you a question. You low life now, you're giving me the silent treatment. You must think you're better than me, don't you? She accused me as she started chucking waffle cones and ice cream sandwiches at me. My natural response was to raise my arms and protect my head. Her rage made her so powerful that we slipped and fell to the floor amidst the altercation. I tried to crawl my way out of there, but she had a firm grip on my left foot. One of my colleagues, the teenager who told me to leave the job, intervened and smashed an entire ice cream cake into the manager's head. Once distracted, she managed to pull her away from me giving me ample time to get to my feet and call my mother, asking her to come to Dairy Queen. However, the manager was still too strong. She immediately got up and strode to the office where she locked herself in. Then, when my mother finally arrived, my friend and I told her everything that had happened. Enraged, my mother demanded to speak to the manager, hence with a clenched fist. She hollered, Come out! What did my daughter ever do to you to deserve this treatment? Face me, you coward. The manager exited the office and headed straight for the kitchen, ignoring my mother's query and complaint. Disgraced, my mother messed up the counter, scattering the straws and utensils on the floor. She pulled my friend and me away. You're not getting paid to be abused, she said fiercely. Then moments later, the manager came back with a mixing bowl as though she were ready to explain herself. But to our surprise, she threw hot cooking oil at us, hitting my arm in the process and giving me mild burns. Our level of toleration had its limits. Hence, all three of us jumped over the counter and charged at her, beating her to a pulp. We scratched her, slapped her, and punched her incessantly, tearing up her clothes when the police finally arrived. Three of us were charged with simple battery while the manager was 